My name is Matthew Kane, and for nearly two years, I thought I could leave the world behind. No more city noise, no more overcrowded streets, and no more chaos. I wanted peace, so I did what a lot of people only fantasize about. I moved off the grid, deep into the Appalachian Mountains. I had no electricity, no cell service, and barely any contact with the outside world. It was just me, a small cabin, and the wilderness. At first, it was perfect. The days were quiet, the air was fresh, and the solitude felt like a blessing. My cabin, nestled between dense woods and a small stream, was a humble one-room structure with a wood-burning stove and enough supplies to last through the seasons. I had solar panels for a little power and a rain catchment system for water, and I was content to live out my days in isolation. But there's something about the mountains. They have their own life, their own way of reminding you that you don't belong there, at least not in the way you think. The Appalachians are old, ancient even, and there's a weight in the air that feels like it's watching you. It started small. I'd hear things at night, just outside the cabin. At first, I told myself it was animals. It had to be. Maybe a bear sniffing around for food, or coyotes scrounging for a meal. But then, the noises became more deliberate. They weren't the usual sounds of the wilderness. They felt closer. Heavy footsteps, like something was walking right up to the edge of my cabin walls and just waiting. There were times when I'd step outside in the morning and find strange markings in the dirt around the cabin. Not animal tracks, something else. The ground would be disturbed, as if something heavy had been dragged or moved. Large, deep impressions, almost like the shape of a hand, but larger, much larger than any human or animal I'd ever seen. I tried to brush it off. Maybe I was just getting paranoid from the isolation. But it wasn't paranoia. One night, I was chopping wood just before sunset. The light was fading, and the air had that familiar chill that comes with the Appalachian nights. As I was stacking logs, I noticed something in the trees, just on the edge of my vision. At first, it looked like a shadow, but it didn't move with the sway of the branches or the wind. It was standing there, watching me. I stopped what I was doing and squinted, trying to make out the figure. It was tall, at least seven feet, maybe more, and it was standing unnaturally still. Its form was human-like, but not quite right. The limbs were too long, the torso too thin. It was like something was wearing the shape of a human, but hadn't quite gotten the details correct. I blinked, and it was gone, vanished into the trees without a sound. That night, I barricaded myself inside the cabin. The wood stove crackled, casting shadows across the walls, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something was out there, just beyond the flickering light. Every snap of a twig, every rustle of the leaves outside made me jump. I sat in silence, knife in hand, waiting for something to happen. Around midnight, I heard it. A knock. Not a gentle one. Three hard, deliberate knocks on the cabin door. I froze. My heart pounded in my chest as I stared at the door, waiting. There was no way anyone could have made it out here. I was miles from the nearest town, and no one knew where I was. No one, except whatever was outside. Another three knocks. This time, louder. I stood up slowly, the knife shaking in my grip. I couldn't bring myself to open the door, so I yelled out, Who's there? Silence. For what felt like an eternity, there was no response. And then, a voice. Low, raspy, and not quite human. It mimicked my voice exactly, repeating, Who's there? My blood ran cold. Whatever it was, it was playing with me. I didn't sleep that night. I kept the fire stoked and the knife close, but nothing else happened. By dawn, I was exhausted and on edge. I needed answers, so I decided to venture into the small town a few hours away and talk to the locals. Maybe they'd heard of something strange in the mountains. At the general store, I struck up a conversation with an old man named Thomas Larkin, who'd lived in the area his entire life. He was in his late seventies, with a grizzled beard and eyes that seemed to have seen everything. When I told him about the figure in the woods and the knocks on my cabin door, his expression darkened. You're lucky you're still here, boy, he said, his voice gravelly with age. Sounds like you've come across the skinwalker. The words sent a chill down my spine. 
I'd heard of skinwalkers. Part of Navajo legend, but I thought they were confined to the southwest, not the Appalachians. Thomas shook his head. They're not just out west. These mountains are old, older than you and me, and there's things in these woods that don't care where the stories come from. The skinwalker ain't the only thing that stalks these hills, but it's one of the nastiest. I listened as he told me stories of hunters who'd gone missing, hikers who'd been found days later, disoriented and babbling about things they'd seen in the woods. He said that the skinwalker could take on the form of a man, an animal, or something in between. It was a shapeshifter, a predator that thrived on fear. I didn't want to believe him, but deep down, I knew he was right. I'd seen it with my own eyes. Leave the cabin, Thomas warned. Whatever it wants, it won't stop until it gets it. I returned to the cabin that afternoon, determined to pack up and get the hell out of there. As I approached, the air felt heavy, like the forest itself was holding its breath. When I reached the front door, I saw it. More markings in the dirt, but this time, they were deliberate. Large, clawed prints, and something that looked like a human handprint, but much larger than my own. I didn't waste any time. I grabbed my essentials, threw them in the truck, and drove out of those mountains without looking back. That was two years ago, and I haven't been back since. Whatever was in those woods, whatever knocked on my door that night, it wasn't human. And I have no doubt it would have killed me if I'd stayed. I'm lucky to be alive. So take this as a warning. The Appalachian Mountains are beautiful, but they're also dangerous. There are things out there that you can't explain, things that shouldn't exist. And if you ever hear three knocks on your door in the dead of night, don't answer. Just leave and don't look back. Myself and some friends were fishing along a tributary of the Ohio River. We came upon three chickens that had been beheaded and disemboweled, but were otherwise completely intact. The bodies had been laid a few feet up from the bank, and were all three side by side. It was clearly done by some pretty clean knife work, was definitely not an animal predator. There was no sign of the missing heads or offal, and the bodies were fairly fresh as rigor mortis hadn't set in yet. No signs of any other people in the area. It was very eerie, and we decided to nope the F out of there. In 2004, just outside of Baghdad, Iraq, while on a night mission guarding a power plant, a large metallic triangle-shaped hovering craft appeared over the plant. On the bottom of the craft were large oscillating red lights. From its appearance to its time of disappearance, there was a period of about 30 minutes. There were about 20 of us soldiers who were eyewitnesses. We reported it to our TOC, and within 10 minutes, the Black Hawks had it in sight and were approaching when this thing just lifted up silently and zoomed out of sight at an incredible speed. The photos I took along with my camera were taken away from me and never returned. It seems no one knew what happened to my photos or camera. I was not a believer in UFO sightings at this point in my life, but this event certainly made a believer out of me. I don't know what it was. I can't say it was a military craft or something out of this world, but I know what I saw, and it was unlike anything I have ever seen in my life. My first eight years of service were in the US Air Force as a crew chief and a jet mechanic, so I have seen a lot of different types of aircraft and know a thing or two about flying objects, and this thing was just mind-blowing. At the time this occurred, I was a grunt attached to a cavalry unit. During one of my hunting expeditions, I stumbled upon an intriguing mystery in the heart of the wilderness. As I delved deeper into the dense woods, my sharp eyes caught sight of footprints so large and distinct that they piqued my curiosity. Intrigued, I decided to follow the trail, unaware that this decision would lead to an encounter beyond my wildest imagination. Choosing to camp near the area where I discovered the peculiar footprints, I had no idea that the night would unfold an enigma that would stay etched in my memory forever. As darkness blanketed the forest, I found myself nestled in my camper, surrounded by an eerie stillness broken only by the occasional rustling in the underbrush. The moon cast an ethereal glow on the surroundings, setting the stage for an extraordinary event. 
Suddenly, the silence was shattered by the rustling sound, and my senses heightened. Peering into the moonlit wilderness, I witnessed a surreal sight, a creature of immense proportions, a Bigfoot standing at an imposing seven to eight feet tall. Its head was peculiar, pointed, and distinct, seemingly attached directly to its broad shoulders, devoid of any visible neck. The creature stood stoically, bathed in the silvery moonlight, a breathtaking and chilling presence in the heart of the forest. Locking eyes with this mysterious being, time seemed to stand still. The encounter left an indelible mark on my perception of the wilderness, leaving me with more questions than answers. As morning broke, I explored the surroundings, finding no trace of the elusive creature. However, the massive footprints remained, silently testifying to the inexplicable encounter that unfolded under the moonlit canopy. My tale of the night I encountered the enigmatic Bigfoot became a legendary story among those who ventured into the uncharted territories of the wild. Not necessarily a hiking story, but as few years ago before I moved away to university, I used to enjoy going for long walks down to my local beach late at night. This one time it was about 11.30 p.m., and next to the beach there is an outcrop of land with an old communications tower on it from World War II. This outcrop is usually where teenagers go to drink during the summer, and where I go to be alone during the quieter months. But as this was a very cold in November, I wasn't expecting to see anyone there at all. I got to the top of the hill before the outcrop, and in the moonlight, I saw what looked like three people sat by the communications tower. I paused my music to try and hear them to confirm it was actually a group of people since it's really really dark out there, sometimes it's hard to distinguish shadows and shapes from actual people. I couldn't hear anything so I kept walking in their direction for a bit longer until I could see more clearly. It was actually three people, but it appeared to be two older men and a young child. I was very confused so I called out to them, and then that's when they noticed me. Without saying anything they all got up, walked towards me, and then turned off to the forest path that went back into town before they got to where I was standing. I'm still very confused what two grown men and a small boy were doing out in such a remote place so late at night. But there has never been any news to indicate it was something suspicious just a standard creepy occurrence in a small coastal town. This isn't really my story, but I happen to know it. This happened in my town. So there was this guy who was walking his dogs during New Year's night. He got shot in the back of his head. My dad was one of the people who worked on the case. Turns out he was shot by a cartel or at least by somebody that got instructions from a cartel. They were looking for someone and the description they used to find him was that their target walked his dogs at night on the same spot as this guy, but they'd shot the wrong guy. The actual target was later arrested by what would be a SWAT team in America. My dad said the actual guy had turned his home into a bunker because after the accident he knew it was for him. Girlfriend and I were doing an overnight hike on the North Country Trail, and after hiking some amount of miles, we decided to hang our hammocks and rest. We were hanging about 30 feet off of the trail, just snoozing a little when I heard a little noise. I sat up in the hammock a bit and saw that there was a coyote about 10 feet away. We locked eyes and it took off. About the same time, something that sounded a bit bigger took off from the other side of us. We packed up our hammocks and kept going. About five minutes down the trail, we came up on a black bear cub and scared it by accident and it took off. This was told to me by my dad. First and foremost my dad was not a believer in aliens, ghosts, Bigfoot or portals. But this he couldn't explain away. My dad was a coon hunter. He owned several dogs and had many friends that Kuhn hunted with him. This happened in the late 1960s. He said one night, he and a buddy took their dogs on a late night run. There is a small conservation area about five miles from our house with picnic tables and primitive campsites. A natural spring runs through the area and it's just a beautiful place, he said they let their dogs out. 
and were sitting on the tailgate of the truck listening to them run. He said they treat a coon, and he and his buddy walked to where they were. These dogs were highly trained to stay at the tree, and not to leave until they got there. He said they got the dogs leashed up, and were starting for the truck when the dogs started whining and whimpering acting completely out of character. His big male hound cowered down and took off breaking the hold my dad had on him. He said they heard a noise like nothing either of them ever heard before mind you these two men had been in the Missouri woods all their lives. He said it was a growling noise, and they could hear footsteps circling them. They both had headlights on and both of them tried to see whatever it was, but it kept out of the light. He said it started chattering like to itself and continued stalking them. He took his gun he carried out and shot into the air a couple of times and the stalking and chattering just stopped. He said they took the dogs and quickly made their way back to the truck. My dad's old male dog was there waiting for them. He said the dogs were acting so strange, cowering and trembling. They got their dogs loaded up, and when they checked the time over two hours was missing. He said the tree the dogs were at wasn't very far from the truck, so walking to them getting the dogs and back to the truck would have been 30-45 minutes at the most. He said they never discussed it with anyone but each other. He didn't tell me until I was grown. After he passed I asked my mom if he told her she said he did the night it happened, and he was scared. My dad was never scared of anything, but that he couldn't explain. He was pale just telling me the story. He said they were stalked by something with heavy footsteps that chattered to itself. This was in the summer late at night near Rolla, Missouri. So when I was younger, 16 or 17 I think, I had an encounter with something strange in the forest near Danbury, Wisconsin. Background on me is that I am 6 foot 4 inches and athletic. I am a hunter, camper, and martial artist, generally a survivalist. I was naive and didn't give nature the proper level of respect and basically was a cocky teenager who felt invincible. Our cabin had been on Long Lake in Danbury, Wisconsin. The whole area is forested for the most part. I was there on vacation with my cousin and grandparents. It was a nice and hot summer day, and we had decided to play airsoft. I took airsoft really seriously. I wore a full BDU woodland with a camouflage mask even. My cousin just wore jeans and a t-shirt. We had a battle which I took into the woods where I felt comfortable. We were about 150 meters into the forest when we stopped. Then I decided to tease my cousin. I shushed him and said, we were being watched jokingly. Unfortunately, it turned out to not be much of a joke, because I immediately then noticed that the woods were dead quiet, which only happens when a large predator is around. I was an edge very quickly. Next, the feeling of being watched hit hard, so I started scanning the surrounding area. Then I saw it. The whitish teeth gave it away. What I saw was at the edge of a clearing about 40 meters from us crouched and holding on to a tree with its left hand. It was panting and watching us with its ears up. It had reddish brown hair and fur and looked canine. In my head, it clicked as a werewolf. I said to my cousin, we have to go, and he bolted. I still had my eyes on it when my cousin started sprinting. The creature charged. It ran on two legs for maybe 10 feet and then dropped to all fours. Then I turned and sprinted. I could hear it crashing through the woods behind us, the who run out of the woods. Once back at the cabin, we discussed it it's still unclear if my cousin saw it. I told him I thought it was a bear to not freak him out, but I know bears, it wasn't a bear. I started doing research on these things after my encounter which brought me to many dogman-related sites. What I saw coincides with other people's sightings. I am now far better about respecting nature, and I am extremely cautious with the forests. If I go into nature alone I am always armed, but I prefer to not be alone. Always trust your senses. This just happened to me less than an hour ago from the time I've started writing this at about 10, 15-ish p.m. in Eastern PA, Bucks County specifically if you know where that is. This first part of my encounter all happened within a span of maybe 20 seconds. I was driving home after seeing my boyfriend. Don't know if y'all care about this, but for your information, I am a 19-year-old female. I want to be completely honest so y'all know I'm not lying. 
I hit a dab cartridge once or twice right before this happened, but I have a very high tolerance and no history of weed-induced psychosis or hallucinations. I even doubted myself about what happened until I told my boyfriend when I got home. This drive is about 45 minutes each way, and a drive I do often, like 3-4 times a week. I know these roads very well, and I'm not easily spooked. I was about 15 minutes into my drive home. It was raining pretty heavily as I was coming down this one highway, and it's pretty dark with only a few street lights here and there. I was pretty much alone on the streets for most of my drive home since it was late and raining. As I was going down this highway at like 60 miles per hour, I suddenly saw this tall, deer-like figure in my headlights about 200 feet from me. I immediately started braking because, from a distance, I thought it was just your typical big buck standing in the middle of the road. Happens all the time in Pia as we have no shortage of deer. But as I was approaching closer to this deer, I see that it's freakishly tall and very slender. It almost looked like someone took an image of a deer and stretched it out vertically, honestly. I also noticed that my headlights aren't lighting this thing up, not even my brights. All I see of it is a bold, black silhouette, right there, in the middle of the road, unmoving. Because all I see is the silhouette, I can't tell if it's standing on four legs or two, but the height and stretched out quality of its appearance has me thinking it was two. I was struggling to brake fast enough to avoid this deer without spinning out on the wet roads, but I eventually slowed down, and as I get slower and closer to this thing, it starts going fuzzy. I squint. I turn my wipers on faster. It's still fuzzy. As I came to a full stop, it suddenly just disappeared completely vanished into thin air. So now I'm stopped in the middle of the road on this empty highway thinking I'm going insane because this roughly 12 foot tall figure that I know I saw just isn't there anymore. It didn't jump out of the way, it didn't run, it just vanished. I shake off the spooks and I hit the gas again, trying to convince myself that I'm going crazy because the alternative was too scary to think about. A few minutes down the road, I see something else. This time a lot smaller, closer to the size of your average deer. But it definitely wasn't a deer or any animal that is widely accepted as real, because it just suddenly showed up in front of my car. Like it wasn't on the left side of the road at all until it was in front of my car, running across the road. I should have hit it. It was right in front of me. With the speed I was going there was no way that it would have made it across the street in time since it was maybe five feet from my car when it first appeared. I didn't even get a chance to brace myself for impact with how close it was. But nothing happened. I didn't hit anything. Not even a rock under my tire. At this point I'm convinced that I've gone certifiably insane. I check my rear view mirrors to see if there even was a deer, but it was too dark to tell. The rest of the way home I drove as slowly as I safely could, just in case I saw something again. Alas, I made it home without another incident. I don't know what exactly I saw. I don't know why if it was a Wendigo, it didn't hurt me since everything I know about Wendigo points to them being malevolent beings. I'm just freaked out I guess and wanted to share my story. If anyone has a better identification for whatever this thing was let me know. For now I think I'm gonna get myself a dash cam. Pennsylvania roads are spooky. Edit. I can't stop thinking about this. I saw an actual deer on my way home from work today and was instantly paralyzed in fear. It felt like it was taunting me. I don't know how to explain it. I could feel its eyes burning on my skin. Just after sunrise, my wife and I were laying in our tent, talking. The tent was situated in a clearing next to the Wilson River, right along the edge of the tree line. We were the only people camping in this clearing, and it was very remote from other camping areas, which is why we chose it. Off in the distance at an angle behind the tent and deep in the forest, we heard what sounded like someone breaking large sticks or small logs against the trunk of a tree. We found this odd because there were no trails or roads where we heard this. Why would anyone be out there? Also, we were the only ones around to the best of our knowledge, as this was not close to any campgrounds. The early hour also added to the strangeness of the sounds we heard. After maybe a couple of minutes of hearing this, 
the sounds became more intense and changed to what sounded more like very large branches being snapped and small trees actually being uprooted and pushed over. The sounds slowly moved towards us at this point. I thought there must be someone driving some kind of machinery through the forest and plowing over anything standing in the way, perhaps a cat being used to forge new access for a logging operation. As it got to within maybe 150 feet of our tent, I realized there was no engine sound. It kept coming closer. When it got to within what sounded like 50 feet or so, the sound of trees being uprooted and broken stopped and was replaced with the sound of very heavy and slow footsteps, still coming closer to the tent. The sound continued approaching until it was within maybe three or four feet behind the tent. Then it stopped as if examining our tent or just waiting. Unfortunately, the tent had no windows to look out, so we just laid there, being as silent as possible while I clutched my hatchet and held my breath. I can't be positive because we were both very frightened by this point, but I thought I could hear what sounded like something huge breathing just a couple of feet off the back of our tent. This may have been my imagination though. My wife said she didn't hear breathing. After a pause of 15 to 20 seconds, the footsteps began to angle off into the forest again. When the footsteps seemed to be 15 or 20 feet away, I quietly got up and crawled out of the tent to see what had made this racket. I walked around the back of the tent, still clutching my hatchet, and peered into the forest. It was too dense to see very far, so I started to venture into the woods towards the direction of the footsteps which I could still hear fading off in the distance. I followed for 20 or 30 feet and could see nothing. That's when the fear got the best of me, and I scrambled back to the tent. We remained in the tent for at least another hour before venturing out. I kept peering into the forest, but didn't see or hear anything again. By now, friends who we were expecting began to show up, so we felt a bit safer. When my curiosity finally got the best of me, I ventured into the forest towards the direction of the crashing and snapping sounds we had heard coming towards us. No one would come with me. After going for 50 or more feet in that direction, I came upon a huge tangle of fallen old growth logs with a very dense stand of smaller trees and dense underbrush on the other side where the sound had originated. Several smaller trees had been snapped off or pushed over. No machine could ever have crossed over the fallen logs, as they were several feet in diameter. And I know of no machine that makes footsteps. Then fear took hold again, and I ran to the safety of the clearing without looking for footprints. I never went back into the forest the entire weekend after that. We could only explain what we heard as being a Sasquatch. The only problem I had with this theory was that I have always thought if these creatures existed, they would be very silent and reclusive, avoiding humans whenever possible, certainly not crashing through the forest like a bulldozer. These sounds were intentional. I can't say for certain what we heard, but I do know without any doubt that it was not a human machinery a bear, an elk, or anything else that might be commonly found in these forests. I've spent much of the last 20 years trying to come up with an explanation for what we heard. I have none other than a Sasquatch. Why it made such a racket is beyond me. I live in South Africa, which is a very dangerous country with lots of crime. Keep this in mind. I'm 18 now, but when I was 14 and still at school, I was part of the land club at my school where once on a Friday night, every couple of months, we would all get together with our computers at school, set them up in a classroom, hook them up to a central modem and play video games together all night. The school I went to was massive and had wide open areas with grass and trees and stuff. Some parts were literally small forests. It's almost like a huge park with buildings scattered throughout it and lots of roads. So one night at Land Club, my friends and I decided to go out for a walk around the school at around 1 am. There were about six of us and we were just walking around until we heard the sound of a car driving around. We found this extremely weird and walked up a little hill until we saw this car driving around in the distance. It was in the middle of the night, but it had no lights on. I had one of those star gazing lasers on me and my dumbass decided to shine it at the windshield of the car. As soon as I did it, the car screeched to a stop. Then it started driving again in our direction. 
That's when we decided to try hide where we were, and we kind of thought of it as a game. We were on the edge of a tiny forest and a large open field. We split up into groups of two and had two in the forest, two on the edge me and a mate and two on the field. All of us were lying down flat on the ground. There was a road about 10 meters in front of us. The car drove right in front of my friend and I and suddenly turned its car so that it was facing us. Then the lights just turned on, blinding us. I couldn't see anything but out of nowhere from the light, I see this dark figure of a man running towards us getting bigger. That's when we bolted. This man had the jump on us so he was super close behind us when we started running. My friend and I split up as we ran and he carried on chasing me. I was shitting myself. Keep in mind this man has not said a single word yet and almost all teachers would at least say something. Now that I think back on it, this part was quite funny. After a while of running, I turned my head to look back to see how far he was behind me, and I did so at the exact right moment because as I did that he literally face planted, and I'll never forget seeing his face drag across the grass. Anyways we kept running, past the land classroom, all the way to the other side of the school. We thought we were safe to hide somewhere there until we heard the sound his car again. We started running again until we were far from the roads and watched from afar. This car was slowly driving around literally looking for us, and even drove as far as the other side of the school. It gives me the chills thinking of what he would have done if he had caught us. To people that think it was probably one of our teachers. His body shape and head shape. He was also bald didn't look anything like our teachers. He clearly saw our faces when he turned the headlights and shone it on our faces, and would have said something on Monday. But no teacher said anything, and we weren't called up. Why would he say nothing? Surely they would say, Hey kids, what are you doing? Why would they be at school at 1am? Creepy stuff. During high school, age 14 or so me, and my mates used to go camping about a mile from the closest road. One night me and two friends Simon and Stuart were waiting for our friend Nick to join us after his date with a girl. It was getting dark, and we were sat in the tent with the door open as it was raining. I was getting paranoid and kept thinking I could see a white figure behind a tree closest to the tent. My friends could see it too, but they just blamed it on the pot and the darkness playing with our eyes. I zipped up the tent after a while as it was freaking me out. The area was heavily wooded, and every now and then I would hear footsteps crunching on the leaves all around the tent. I kept telling them to shut up and listen, but it would always go quiet just after. After about an hour or so forgetting all about it, we all heard the most terrifying sound of shing. Like something sharp or blunt being scraped against something nearby. We all looked at each other and held breath, shitting ourselves. When sound happened a second time, we all started putting on our shoes in a panic and ran out of the tent in the direction of my friend's house about a mile away. We ran in the dark and rain through a field and then the woods until we met the road and walked to my friend's house all scared and shaking. Shortly after we got in Nick rings us asking where the hell we are, saying he's at the campsite. We shouted down the phone to get the hell out of there and described what we heard. He told us to stop joking around asking where we are. When he got back he said he walked all around the campsite and the fields to try and find us as he still thinks we're joking. Walking through the woods he heard the footsteps of a person. He called out, thinking it was us. When he was met with no reply, he quickly ran back. We all went back in the morning and nothing was taken or moved. Fourteen years later, I still have no idea what that was. Hiking the Appalachian Trail one summer. In Vermont, I come up to an old white fire tower, which is on the trail as a night camp. It's about 11.30, and my headlamp goes out almost when I get to the building. I step in, and it looks like a museum. Wool blankets, food on an old tin plate, kerosene lantern, and Osborne Firefinder. Straight out of a 1920s photograph. Right down to the old Forest Service pack in the corner. Obviously someone was here because there was food on the plate, so I grab the bunk and go to sleep. Get up at 7am and everything is gone. I'm laying on the floor in a completely empty boarded up fire tower. 
No, nothing inside, but a note that said, Thanks for spending the time. It's been a while. When Elle was a young kid, my family and Elle went to Yosemite Park. One evening after a hike, Elle saw something moving in the trees ever. It was like looking through water, but it had a shape. Elle tried to show my dad, but he didn't see it. I remember him telling me my eyes were playing tricks because it was getting dark. Years later, when the movie Predator came out, Elle almost jumped out of my seat. That is what I saw. A while ago I came across your site and read about David Eckhart and his family as well as other unexplained things you write about. I decided to send you my description of something that happened to me when I was 14 years old. Every August my family, aunt, uncle and cousins would spend a week camping at Cabolingo State Forest. It was a tradition because my grandparents used to do the same thing when they were raising my dad and aunt, except we were using campers. Back then we could take our bikes along and go all over the place. In the summer of 1991, my cousin's two boys, we were all within three years of age of each other, decided to go to an area we had never been before. I remember seeing a trail sign that had Sleepy Hollow on it, so I suppose that was the name of the area. Most of the trail was along a small creek, and it was a very thick forest. It was around noon time, and it had been overcast all day. We were raised in a rural area so our parents didn't worry too much about us exploring the park. There was a group of large rocks near the trail, so we decided to stop and take a look. We were just jabbering when we noticed a loud humming sound coming from above us. We looked up into the trees and were hit in the face with what I describe as a blast of energy. All I can remember is my cousins yelling at me because I had been knocked out. I asked them what happened, and they said they were knocked out as well. We started to get scared because everything around us seemed different than before, so we headed back to the campsite. When we got back my mom asked me why we didn't come back for dinner. I looked at my watch, it was gone. I hadn't even noticed. She told me it was just after 7 p.m. No wonder everything seemed strange out on the trail. We must have been knocked out for about six hours. My cousins and I were very tired so much so that we headed to our bunks right after eating. I was exhausted, but I couldn't fall asleep. In the morning I was feeling very sluggish. My cousin slept until 11 am. Later in the day, we decided to tell our parents what happened out on the trail. To be honest, our parents thought we were playing a stunt on them by concocting this wild story about being knocked out for six hours by a blast of energy. I was very upset with them, especially my dad because he never let me forget about it. To this day, he still thinks it was a made-up story. My cousins and I still talk about what happened that day. We all feel that we were possibly abducted because of some of the weird dreams each of us has had since. In 2005, I was diagnosed with leukemia though I'm now in remission. One of my cousins was recently diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma, while my other cousin has suffered kidney disease for over 10 years. We had been 100% healthy before the incident on the trail. Though we have never seen any scars or marks on our bodies, we truly feel that we were physically and mentally violated by something. When I was around 11-12 years old, I was living in Torrance, California, specifically at 1721 Fern Avenue for reference, or if you want to look up the house on Google Maps. Well, I am a bookworm, and ever since I was a toddler, I would stay up way past bedtime reading. So, on this night, I want to say it was January right after the new year of 1999 to 2000, I was up reading in bed. Now, my bed was horizontal against the big picture window with no screen, only thin old plate glass that was always letting in a draft. I heard this strange noise, which sounded like metal scratching on the window panes. The blinds were drawn, so I couldn't immediately see what the source of the shrill, jarring noise might be. I opened up the blinds I had only the small bedside lamp for internal light, by the way. When I opened the blinds, I was shocked and frozen in primordial recoil and terror. I've been a 40 and through and through since I was a small child. However, 
nothing can prepare you for your own first-person face-to-face encounter with an extra-dimensional or inhumanoid etc. I just remember being transfixed and turned to stone by what I was witnessing before my very own and very young eyes. It was a dull slate gray color, matte skin but strangely textured. What came to mind was the Pascagoula, Mississippi, abduction of Travis and Clayton. Not in the overall appearance of the entity, but its skin was textured like an elephant's wrinkled texture. It was standing at my window and came up to the middle or bottom of this huge window. Now, keep in mind that the house was a 1940s house and was about 5-6 feet off the ground. Also, this window overlooked a cement driveway and the home had no roof overhang. By gauging that it was at least 5-6 feet at its feet by the height it was standing at, I presumed that it was about 7-7 seven, seven foot 5 feet tall. It was, as I said, a dull matte charcoal or faded concrete like sun-washed concrete color. It had an ovalesque head, a long slender neck, broad perfectly toned shoulders, wide sinewy muscle on its chest, and it didn't look nude no nipples or any hair, but it didn't look clothed either. It was lithe and muscular in a thin, rope-like muscular way. It had one hand, I presume, down to its side. The other arm and hand were raised and came to an apex in the palm, in which three fingers were crawling across my windowpane. The fingers terminated in long square nails or claws about four or five inches or so long, almost like nail extensions in the traditional square manicure style, but instead of normal keratin, these claws or nails were metal, as in metallic in texture and reflection, but the shade of burnished pewter. I recall them clinking rhythmically across the glass. Now, the most stunning and haunting aspect of this was the face no nose, no mouth, no hair, just a perfectly ovoid, if a little gaunt, face shape with two glowing, even burning red eyes. These eyes were emanating light from within. It burned like I recalled at the time in my mind, like old Univac mainframe red diodes. That every so slightly infrared red, the light from the eye shine was hot, slightly searing, and very nauseating. Throughout this entire time, I was overwhelmed by a sense of dread primal, otherworldly, unplaceable, unlike anything I'd ever experienced or read about. I will post part 2 within a day. Thanks for your patience, y'all. Twenty years ago, I was still a kid and went with my grandpa for a quick rabbit hunt on the family farm grounds. It was summer, hot, humid, and still dark around 5 a.m. My grandpa loved getting up early to catch wild rabbits that he would cook during the afternoon for all his grandchildren. Good times. One day, I accompanied him down a small trail flanked by stone walls. This trail was also used as a water channel at night to irrigate the corn fields manually, driving natural water sources through the geography of the land. So, we were walking over the walls, trying not to get wet. Suddenly, after about an hour of walking, we started to hear church bells with an odd intensity. There was no church for miles around, so I went and asked my grandfather where that bell sound was coming from. As soon as I looked at him, I knew something was wrong. He was livid yellow and turned around immediately, telling me to follow him quickly into the cornfield. I did so, and while we were lying down in the middle of the field, Full of mud and wet from the water still flowing through the fields at that time of the morning, a strong sound started to come towards us. The only way I can describe it is as if a tornado was about to hit us. Extremely strong winds suddenly crashed on us, and at times, while hiding my face under my arms, it felt like wild animals were passing through and destroying the entire field. This lasted a couple of minutes with fierce intensity. I didn't know what was going on and I felt my grandfather just trying to protect me from whatever was ripping the corn apart. As soon as it stopped, we heard the church bells once again for a few seconds, and everything became dead silent. My grandfather stood up and told me to run back home. I held his hand, and we got out of there as quickly as possible. On the way home, he told me not to say a thing about this to anyone because it would cause problems around the village. In my mind, I was just curious about what kind of wild beast would be capable of crossing the fields, causing such chaos to the point that an entire field was destroyed in minutes. Looking back, I realized that while I was curious, my grandfather was scared to death. His behavior was never the same about hunting, and as far as I know, he quit rabbit hunting forever. 
The next day, I went back to check it out, determined to find something. As I couldn't ask anyone, all I could do was research by myself. An eight-year-old boy's curiosity cannot be stopped. While I was walking, I got a bit scared that it could happen again. Then, I remembered the bells and realized that it couldn't be an animal because it wouldn't explain the bells. I started to get confused and not liking the fact that I was alone a couple of miles away from someone else. Anyway, I got to the very same spot and stared at the field in horror. The field was immaculate. Not a sign of any wind, animal stomping. Nothing. This couldn't be. I still was wearing the same muddy shoes. I still could vividly remember corn flying around and getting crushed. And yet, the field was perfect. Tall green corn rose until you lose sight. Creeped out, I ran even faster than hours ago and headed straight to my grandpa. I told him that I went back and the field had no signs of any activity. He looked at me with empty, weird eyes and told me, I don't know what you are talking about. We went for a hunt and all went okay. I understood that he would forever refuse to talk about this again, and I never mentioned the story until his death a few years ago. When I told the story during a family dinner, an old haunt of my father told me, oh again with Devil's Gate rubbish story. I thought that this nonsense fairy tale was long forgotten. Turns out, this was something that multiple people allegedly experienced back in the days, and no one ever believed those people. Devil's Gate was one of the names for the entrance to that field through that trail. Funny enough, behind this gate, there still is a rare pomegranate tree that we've been told as kids to never touch the fruits. Anyway, I never went hunting again. I can't remember the name of the pass, but we were crossing the mountains from Nevada into California on our way to Yosemite to hike Half Dome. There was place in the pass where a couple of abandoned buildings stood, an old house, an old motel, lots of trash like appliances, bicycles. We pull past the abandoned small town, which was very eerie at dusk, and drive up a road to the top of a small hill overlooking the town and the rest of the mountain range. It was a very pretty view, but the sun was setting fast, so we threw up a shade for some cover and set out the rest of the cots and bags to sleep under the stars. My younger sister was especially creeped out about sleeping under the stars up the hill from a spooky empty motel. The next morning, my dad called me over to a spot five feet from where my sister was still sleeping, behind a medium-sized bush, and pointed out a grave. It was one of those old west-looking graves where the dirt is piled high, and the cross is made from found wood nearby. My sister freaked out when we showed her. Nothing too scary happened, but I was glad to tear down camp and leave right away. I'm here in Charleston, West Virginia, but back in 2011, December 15th, I was traveling through Point Pleasant for work on us Route 35, it was about 3, 3.30 in the morning, icy conditions. The roads were snow covered. Just your typical December early morning in West Virginia. I was going around this bend and this big figure appeared in the roadway. I mean, I couldn't see anything beyond it. It looked to be maybe eight to 10 feet tall. It looked to have wings. I just stopped in the middle of the road. I couldn't go anywhere. I froze. Not only my vehicle was stopped, but I froze and this figure, whatever it was, just stood there in the middle of the road and I was there for, I don't know, a minute or two minutes. I mean, I don't know how long, but it seemed like forever and it finally darted off into the woods. And I sat there for another few minutes, trying to collect myself. I kept going around the bend and about a mile up the road a tractor trailer had jackknifed. There were no other vehicles around. It looked like it just happened. Luckily, I was able to call emergency services and get them out on the scene. I just had this weird feeling about myself. Well, going back to 1967, December 15th, there at the Silver Bridge, my great-grandfather actually went across the Silver Bridge like an hour or so before it collapsed and my great-grandma. I never had a chance to meet my great-grandfather, but my great-grandmother said that, he said, after everything had happened, he had this weird feeling about himself going across that bridge and as soon as he got to work. He worked at one of the factories out there at Point Pleasant, and he said that he just had this weird feeling about himself, 
And that's how I felt about what happened on December 15th, 2011, so many years after the Silver Bridge collapse. I never really could tell what the creature was. I just know that it was a big dark figure, probably about 50 feet in front of me. It was in my headlights and it was snowing. It was just me in the vehicle and like I said, it was like 3 in the morning or something like that. I mean it was just, I don't know if it was warning me not to go right then like whenever that tractor trailer jackknifed. It was like it was just telling me you need to stop and I did. I know why so many people go missing from national parks. I don't know why I went to Mount Rainier. I mean, I know what I went to Mount Rainier for, but to this day, I don't really know why I felt so compelled to go. I've always been obsessively curious. I think that's probably the best way to describe it. I get these fascinations for things out of seemingly nowhere, and once that fascination lodges itself in my head, it quickly starts to take over every waking aspect of my life, it seems. Thinking about it turns into reading about it. Reading about it turns into researching it as thoroughly as possible. Research leads to investigation. And the rabbit hole of my obsessions just goes and goes. And then as suddenly as this obsession starts, it's gone. Complete and total disinterest, just like that. Ever since I was a kid, it's been this way. I kind of compare it to an itch. And ultimately, the only way to really stop an itch is to scratch it, right? I remember laying on my couch on a rainy off day from work and scrolling through YouTube while I waited for the Domino's guy to drop off some buffalo wings when a strange title I'd never heard of came up and caught my eye. Missing 411. Strange and unexplained disappearances in America's national parks. As soon as I clicked on that video, I knew I'd found my newest obsession. The Diet Love Pass incident I had been researching for months now was gone and out the window. Hindsight's always 2020, as the saying goes. I had no idea that I was about to set an unchangeable course that led me to the horrifying reality I was soon to discover. Three weeks and probably a hundred videos, a handful of ordered books, and an endless scrolling through every forum and internet thread I could get my hands on, and I was still just as enamored with these, missing 411s, as I'd been when I first clicked on that initial YouTube video. I'd be genuinely surprised if there were a lot of people reading this who didn't know about David Paulides, the missing 411s, and all of confounding mysteriousness that surrounded these matters. But for those who might be out of the loop, I'll do my best to sum it up in few little bullet points for you. Cliff notes or whatever. 1. There have been a disturbingly large number of unexplained disappearances in America's national parks, and by large number I mean 2,000. That's more than everyone in the North Tower on 9-11. 2,000 people just vanishing in the woods with no explanation whatsoever. 2. A lot of these people are never seen or heard from again. That in its own right is insane given the technologies that we have, and the massive searches that are sometimes carried out for these people. But what's even weirder is that the people that are eventually found leave us more questions than answers. Kids go missing and are found miles and miles away from the initial search zone. Way further than even top survival experts are able to walk. People's bodies turn up in super obvious areas that have been searched multiple times by search and rescue teams. Search dogs will have a good obvious trail on the missing person and then just lose it. Sometimes all they find are the person's shoes. Sometimes they find the person with no shoes at all. Sometimes the bodies look like they've fallen from a great height despite there being no high ground to fall off of, etc. 3. The number of times military units have been deployed to go and search for missing people is eyebrow-raising to say the least. The military is very effective, but they're not search and rescue. They're trained to seek and destroy, not really search and save. 4. The National Park Service gets very, very sketchy when it comes to any kind of further inquiry. This has led a lot of people to believe that they're covering something up. Now, me being the obsessive person that I am immediately started trying to sleuth around for some kind of conclusion. What was the overall theory? What did people think was going on here? I guess because the speculation can go on forever. The theories go on forever too. Everything from rich megalomaniacs on, hunting trips, aliens, windigos and skinwalkers, Bigfoot abductions, parallel universes. The list is truly endless. 
So many different theories, and as wild as some of them might sound at first. It's beyond eerie how quickly they begin to sound more than rational, and even possible with just a little bit of explanation. But as I poured through the seemingly endless accounts and rumors, there was one theory that hit a stronger chord with me than the rest. Feral people. In a nutshell, the theory is that during the Great Depression, maybe even earlier, people took off with their families deep into these wilderness regions to live off the land and get away from the crippling poverty of the cities and towns during that time. Generations of incest and isolation resulted in their ancestors being what we would consider feral, completely hostile, incapable of reasoning that we can comprehend, with a multi-generational knowledge of the land they lived in and how to survive it. Paired with a relatively untouched government protected after all access to a virtually endless number of resources. Other humans, if the opportunity presented itself, could not only be a decent food opportunity, but they were also food opportunity with extremely valuable tools just ripe for taking, like cereal with a prize in the box. Can you imagine how valuable a water bottle would be to a caveman? How wildly priceless a fishing pole would look? The National Park Service knows about these feral people, but they also know it'd be a huge risk to go traipsing in the wilderness looking for bloodthirsty cannibals that are more competent and dangerous than even the most apex predators they live with. They also provide an extremely valuable insight for scientists to study all sorts of things about human nature. But from time to time they get a little too close, or they get to bold and give their locations away. The military gets called in to dispose of these tribes in a discreet and efficient manner before more people disappear. And as a result more people take to the woods to find their missing people. For whatever reason this theory made perfect sense to me. Well, almost perfect sense. It checked almost all the boxes. Children and elderly people go missing because they're the easiest to overpower. Hikers who are by themselves go missing because they're by themselves and can be ambushed quicker than a group of hikers could. Hunters go missing because they're far off the beaten path and they have weapons that are worth the risk. It even explains why bow hunters tend to go missing more than gun hunters. Bows are easier to figure out and lower maintenance. We already know people go missing without a trace and are never found again. Would it be so wild to say in the same breath that people are never found in the first place for the same reasons? Even most of your Bigfoot sightings in these national parks could be explained with the feral people theory. Imagine what you would look like if you had never had a haircut, if you'd never taken a shower or clipped your nails or combed your hair or shaved your beard. Throw a Habsburg jaw or a heavy brow in the mix from years of interfamilial breeding, and you're pretty much the perfect definition of a Sasquatch at that point. But for all the information and cross-examinations that I would read about to seemingly prove this theory, there were admittedly a few glaring loopholes that with a bit more thought would very quickly start to pull the whole idea apart. Humans are truly a scourge on this planet. Anywhere we go we leave a mess, we make smoke from fires, we burn things down accidentally, we cut down trees and leave bones lying all over the place. The very steps we take kill the forest floor, leaving huge patches of dirt wherever we stay for more than a few days. We are hands down the easiest animal to find. Every human that's ever walked the earth inherently believes that the earth is theirs. I guess that manifests even in the most unconscious of ways. Not to mention the scientific probabilities, infertility that comes with incest, crippling genetic mutations, etc. For all the positive evidence, I'll be the first to admit there were some serious holes in the theory. So around and around I went with this concept. For months. Ruling it in and ruling it out. Until one day I was given what I can only describe as a divine revelation. Like the conspiracy gods took pity on my slow decay into insanity, and threw me a nice big bone to chew on. And this one actually had some meat on it. I had fallen asleep on the couch amidst another bout of determined research. YouTube was once again in the background. When I woke up from my nap, I went for the remote when the narrator of the video caught my attention. Missing 411s had rabbit holed into unexplained mysteries in general, and unexplained mysteries had rabbit holed into crazy discoveries made by scientists and historians. The narrator was talking about this skull that had been found. The picture of it was posted up for the viewer to see while he talked about it. It was an old weathered looking skull that had puncture holes in the cranium part, 
Because of these holes, scientists thought for a long time that this child had been the victim of a human sacrifice. But through a series of discoveries, it was made apparent that this child in actuality had been picked clean off the ground by a crowned eagle. Suddenly it hit me. I sprang out of my seat like a madman as all the pieces began to fall together like an Arabic's cube that was all but solving itself. Giant. Eagles. I know, I know. It sounds ridiculous. On the surface more ridiculous than any other theory brought forward. But like my dad always said, the difference between batchet and guano is the stuff that's inside it. And this was no different. I'm not going to get into every painful detail here. But I do have to point out a few just to show you where I'm coming from here. 1. Eagles eat takeout. They swoop in. Snatch and kill their food, fly it back, and eat in the nest. This explains why people go missing and are never found again. They're being looked for somewhere on the forest floor. When they've actually been carried up a mountain and dropped in a nest somewhere. This also explains why the people who are found are way further out than they by all rights should be and why so many seem to have fallen from a great height. The eagle takes someone who's a little too heavy, takes someone who doesn't die right away and squirms a bit too much, gets spooked or startled and needs to fly faster, and they drop their meal. 2. Eagles are ambush predators. They hang out on a perch, and as soon as they see a tasty snack, they swoop and pin it down, kill it, then swoop back with their newly acquired meal to wherever it is they nest at. This explains why so many lone hikers go missing off a trail. Just like a hunter would babysit a game trail for deer, an eagle babysits a footpath for humans, and speaking of deer. 3. An eagle large enough to swoop up with a human would more than likely have a reliable food source of deer, and there are a crap ton of deer. In Yellowstone alone, there are over 2,000 mule deer running around, and that's just mule deer, and this is the very reason why hunters go missing. If you're out hunting a deer then chances are you're wearing scents and making deer calls. In other words, you are actively trying to convince deer that you are in fact also a deer. But the same artificial smells and bleats that would attract a nice big ten point would just as easily be a free food sign for a large bird of prey. 4. This also explains why so many times only aspects of the missing person have been found. Shoes, backpacks, cameras, hiking sticks, bows, etc. Eagles are smart creatures. They probably learned pretty quickly that there's a lot of stuff on these humans that aren't edible. Clothing can be torn through easily enough, but the thicker, more durable stuff gets ripped off and discarded, like a deer's antlers. The feet are torn off by the ankles and smaller animals eat whatever is left inside. Now, I know if you're reading this, you're probably thinking one glaring thing. Come on Saint underscore Circa. You'd think someone would notice giant eagles flying around. But they have. That's why the National Park Service gets so shady when people try to investigate further. They are well aware that there are giant eagles living in the hundreds of miles. These national parks reach out to sometimes, and considering eagles only hunt in a roughly 15-20 mile perimeter around their nests. They know exactly where to find them as well. America's national bird is the bald eagle. It's been that way since 1782. By 1963, there were only 400 nesting pairs of bald eagles in the entire country. Why? Because people shot them out of the sky in droves. Not for their meat, not for their valuable talons or beaks. Researchers say that these eagles were killed mainly to see them up close. That's it. Do you think for half a second there wouldn't be a thousand hillbillies with birdshot scouring the entire countryside the second? It was discovered that there were giant eagles flying around. My best guess is that the National Park Service works in tandem with wildlife conservationist groups to keep these endangered animals as secret as possible. But you can't just let giant man-eating eagles F each other willy-nilly and fly around eating whatever they want whenever they feel like. No one's going to go spend money to hang out at a natural park they'll be killed and eaten at. That'd be horrible for business. In comes the military. You see. It's not just the military that's sent out to find these missing people. It's one particularly small, but highly effective section of the military, and that section is the Green Berets. Green Berets have a large set of skills, but two of their main purposes are special reconnaissance and unconventional warfare. 
and almost all their operations fall under the category of classified. In layman's terms, they specialize in finding things and reporting information on it, and killing things in very unique and creative ways. And then of course they're not allowed to talk about any of it. Total secrecy. You think these guys get called out because Tiny Tim got turned around in the woods? Bullshit. The government can't even send a real hazmat team to Palestine, Ohio when a chemical fire radiates the entire town. No, they go out there when park rangers suspect Tiny Tim got turned into a giant eagle's lunch, and they need the best of the best to identify if that is indeed the case and take it down or dispose of it properly if it is, and keep their mouths shut about it afterwards. They get sent out when scientists speculate that the giant eagle population has grown too high and is risking compromise. The Green Berets go out and depopulate a bit, keep the population under control, and keep their mouths shut about it afterwards. They get sent out when one dies so they can collect the body for research, and keep their mouths shut about it afterwards. I was absolutely sure of it, but even after this certainty cemented itself into everything else I knew to be true, a new dangerous itch began to invade the back of my mind. You can't just know that a house is haunted. You have to actually see the ghost, don't you? I fought it for longer than I thought possible, but within seven months of watching that first video, I found myself driving to Mount Rainier. I had to complete the experiment. I had to be sure that I was sure that I was sure. How's that song go? The old 80s one, blinded with science, took forever to plan the trip. I'd already been spending weeks studying things about eagles, but now I had to reorient and study how to spot eagles. When they hunted, how to watch them without spooking them, etc. But after four deep diving months, I had my plan and everything I needed to carry it out. I chose Mount Rainier for two reasons. The first being it was close. The second being that there have been an unusual number of disappearances, not only on the mountain itself, but in the entirety of the national park that surrounded it. Even by national park standards, in the small hours of the morning, as the sun was just beginning to rise, I took off down the trail and began looking for the perfect spot to set up my blind. See normal eagles hang out in big trees or on the sides of cliffs, but my hypothesis was that a giant eagle would probably be hanging out in crevices against cliffs. When something it could eat walked into its radar, it would swoop out and ambush it. About four hours into my trip, I found a spot I thought was ideal. A small hilltop with trees, but not too many trees. At the bottom of the hill to my left a large cliff wall could be seen. To the right was relatively flat land with enough space in between for a large bird to fly through unhindered. And so, I waited and waited and waited. For three days I sat in that blind, watching the deer, eating cold emres and trying my hardest not to doze off. At the beginning of day four, however, it would all change. I was just considering leaving. When you're alone in a ramshackle tent, it doesn't take long for your mind to convince you of what an idiot you are. Giant eagles. Come on Saint underscore Circa, look at all the time you've wasted. Why can't you get hooked on something productive? As a big ten point stepped out of the brush into the area just in front of me, I watched it with a sort of boredom. Deer are cool the first time you see one. But this had to have been the 100th deer in three days that I'd seen, and at the end of the day they're just horses with antlers. They mosey, they eat, they poop and leave. I guess in my boredom I didn't really notice how quiet the forest had gotten. The deer did though. It stopped mid-bite and perked its head up, locked rigidly into place with a big mess of grass hanging out of its mouth. And that's when it happened. It was so fast my mind hardly had time to process it. One moment the deer was standing there, and the next it was pinned to the ground. I sat there wide-eyed and in shock from the hidden barrier of my blind. Standing over this thing was the largest animal I had ever seen. Its huge wingspan seemed to stretch endlessly, it had to have been forty feet from end to end. The forest floor was shaded almost completely as its outstretched wings blotted the sun from the sky. Even without the wings it was almost too large to comprehend at least eight feet off the ground on its two taloned legs, its dinosaur-like eyes gazing emptily into its prey like huge orbs of golden fire. The poor animal let out one bleated scream before the eagle's large beak tore into its neck. 
sending streams of blood and tissue across the forest floor like something out of a slasher movie. I could hear bones crunching violently even from the distance I was at. Suddenly I realized I had to take a photo. No one would believe it if I didn't show them firsthand. Even then they'd have probably thought it was just a hoax. Green screens and CGI and Photoshop, all that shit. I raised the lens of my camera towards the creature with shaking hands and snapped a shot. Huge. Huge mistake. As soon as the camera made that stupid little fluttering sound the eagle's head snapped instantly in my direction. Its lifeless eyes staring with pure instinct straight through the camouflage of my structure. It saw me. Before I could react, there was a sharp blast of wind. In less than a moment the entire blind was ripped off of its stakes and thrown into the woods around me. As I recovered and looked around, panic-stricken, I could see the horrible thing tearing into the remnants of the plastic structure some 15 or 20 feet in front of me, trying to find me inside of it. With everything I could muster I took off in the direction of my car. I've never ran so fast in my life. It took a long time to get back to my car, and the few times a stop to try and catch my breath or dry, heave I was all but sure would result in me being another missing 411 on Mount Rainier. After what felt like days of almost endless running, I made it back to my car, exhausted and frightened for my life. As I sat in the driver's seat hyperventilating from exhaustion and weeping from fear, I couldn't wrap my mind around what I'd just witnessed, or how I was still here to think about it. The only thing I could think about was getting the hell as far away from Mount Rainier as possible. As I made the long drive home, and my thoughts began to somewhat return to me, I concluded that the eagle must have gotten itself trapped in the blind just long enough for me to get away. It was either that or the deer it had killed had way more meat than I did, and it was already dead. I guess it'd be pointless to chase a smaller prey. Eagles are wicked smart after all. I tried to contact several authorities afterwards, but surprise surprise. No one believed it. You know sir, eagles are a lot bigger than people initially think they are. Are you sure you weren't using any illegal substances? Okay, well we'll send someone out to look at it and tell you what we find. Uh huh, we'll let you know if we find anything. We'll let you know. That camera is still out there in the woods with the rest of my stuff. I don't know if I'll ever be brave enough to try and go back for it. Maybe someone will find it and the truth will be that much harder to dismiss. For now, I only have you guys to tell. The National Park Service is hiding something big in the mountains and forests of the United States, and if you ever go hiking in one of these remote places, make sure you are never alone. I'm a park ranger in a remote area of the woods where few people come to visit. My days are usually filled with monitoring the wildlife and ensuring that the campers follow the rules. One day, a woman and her daughter came to fish in the river that runs through the woods. Later in the day, the woman's daughter came running towards me, telling me that she had found huge four-toed tracks near the riverbank. I was curious but skeptical as bear tracks are commonly found in these woods. However, the other fishermen who had gathered around to listen to her were nodding their heads in agreement, saying they had never seen tracks like that before. I decided to investigate the tracks for myself, and the young girl eagerly led me back to the spot. Sure enough, there were tracks that were larger than any bear tracks I had ever seen, and had four toes instead of the usual five. As I examined the tracks more closely, I noticed that they were imprinted deep into the ground and the claw marks were clear. My mind raced as I tried to think of what animal could have made these tracks. As I was looking at the tracks, I heard rustling in the nearby bushes. I quickly grabbed my binoculars and focused them on the spot, and to my surprise, I saw a large creature moving through the brush. It was unlike anything I had ever seen before it was huge covered in dark fur and had four legs, but moved in a way that was unlike any bear or other animal I had ever seen. I knew that the woman and her daughter had to be warned of the possible danger, so I quickly made my way back to their campsite. I informed them of what I had seen and urged them to leave immediately. They quickly packed their things and left with a newfound sense of urgency. 
After they had left, I went back to the spot where I had seen the creature. I searched the area, but there was no sign of it. However, the tracks were still there, and they confirmed that something large and unknown had been there. As I made my way back to the ranger station, I couldn't help but wonder what other secrets lay hidden in these woods, waiting to be discovered. The experience had left me both excited and fearful of what else might be out there. This happened when I was 15, near Algonquin Park. My father and I were driving up to our cottage in the middle of winter. I always was so amazed at the beauty of Algonquin Park in Muskoka, and had grown up enjoying the beauty of it every summer. Our cottage was on a large lake, about a 30-minute drive from the nearest town. There were probably thousands of cottages on the lake. During the summer, the lake and the town's population tripled. It was cottage country, so people would spend all summer enjoying the lake in warm nights around campfires with family and friends. I spent every summer there growing up, and it still brings fond memories of sunshine and laughter and the sound of motorboats on the lake. But the winters were different. The people that didn't live there all year would venture back home to the city life, leaving the area mostly deserted, with cottages boarded up for the winter. There were a few people that still frequently would come up every couple of months for a few days or so, but for the most part the lake was silent during the winters and the town was just filled with locals. The beautiful pine trees are always covered with snow, making the forest quiet. Our cottage was on a dead-end road. There were about 20 other cottages on the road, with ours being somewhat in the middle. The cottages were quite spaced out, however, with our closest neighbors being too far away to see through the trees. My dad had needed to head up to the cottage to do some painting that my mom had been bugging him to do. It was at the end of February, and it was a long weekend so I tagged along so he wouldn't be alone and we could spend some quality time together. It was about a five hour drive from our home, but turned out to be an eight hour drive due to the heavy snow. It had gotten dark out quite early, and it was around midnight as we drove through Algonquin Park. It was deadly quiet and pitch black except for the headlights of the car. We finally passed through the park with only about 30 minutes left to get to the cottage. It had stopped snowing, and we were both eager to get there. As we turned onto the familiar road, I remember my dad cursing. It hadn't been plowed yet. This wasn't surprising, however. It probably wouldn't be until later the next day that we would even see a snow plow. As we drove down the road, I noticed there was a fresh set of tire tracks. The Smiths must be up for the weekend my dad had said. All of a sudden as we drove around the bend, following the tire tracks, the headlights of the car shone on a white van that was parked on the side of the road. It was almost hidden by the vast trees that were covered with snow. What the? My dad mumbled. As we drove past the white van I remember looking back through the back window and very clearly seeing two figures in the front seat illuminated by our retreating tail lights. I told my dad this, and he shrugged. Maybe they're lost. I nodded but couldn't help to think about how it was a dead-end road, and why they would feel the need to park there. As we pulled into our driveway and we started bringing our stuff in, I couldn't shake the feeling that something wasn't right. I couldn't stop thinking about that van and why it was there, with two people just sitting in the dark in the middle of the night. It spooked me so much that I begged my dad to let me sleep upstairs with him, instead of sleeping downstairs in the room my sister and I usually shared. It had big windows with no blinds that looked out into the blackness of the forest, and my fifteen-year-old self was already scared of the dark, even without seeing the white van. It wasn't a big deal when my sister was there, but not tonight. As my dad got ready for bed, I sat in the living room reading a book, my dad had turned all the lights off, and I was just using a small lamp next to the couch to try and get through one last chapter before bed. It was so quiet I could almost hear my ears ringing. I also started to get the feeling that I was being watched. 
The living room had large windows also with no curtains that overlooked the lake, and it was black except for a light or two from cottages across the lake. I shut off the lamp and got up. Now that the cottage was dark, the moon was shining brightly, illuminating the snow. It was beautiful, and I walked towards the window to get a better look. Movement caught my eye, and I remember my heart dropping as I saw two figures down by the back porch, below the window, barely hidden by the surrounding trees. I dropped to the floor and crawled towards the bedroom where my dad was sleeping, my heart in my throat. I wasn't sure if they had seen me or not. I woke my dad up, and by the time he got to the window, the two figures were gone. Where I had seen the figures, two sets of footprints in the snow lead back around to the front of the cottage and back down the driveway. I begged my dad not to go outside. He double-checked the locks and turned on the porch lights, hopefully to scare anyone off. My dad wasn't as freaked out as I was, but still set the alarm before he headed back to bed. I remember being very freaked out, and I lay there all night next to my dad, terrified I'd look out the window and see someone staring back at me. The next morning my dad went outside and confirmed that there were two sets of footprints leading from the road to in behind our cottage, and then back around to the front of the cottage and back up to the road. There were tire marks that showed the vehicle had turned around and then gone back up to the main road. My dad guessed that they were probably looking to break in and steal stuff as it was the middle of winter and not too many people were up at the lake. But they knew we were there. They would have seen our tire tracks leading to our cottage and my dad's car parked out front. They also may have seen the lamp I had turned on to read and or seeing it go off. My dad didn't have an answer to that and after much back and forth, he called the non-emergency line and reported it. Apparently there had been some break-ins in the area and some stuff had been stolen from some cottages that were boarded up for the winter. But again, and I still wonder to this day, why would they be interested in stealing from a house that clearly has people inside it? I'd wanted to be a police officer ever since I was just a little boy. I have dressed up for one every single Halloween that I can remember. There simply wasn't any other job that I ever had an interest in. This is probably due to the fact that my own father was a more well-known officer in the L, a PD and my role model for everything in my life. As soon as I completed high school, I immediately tried to get enrolled in the police academy, got accepted, and began my training. Recently, I just celebrated 10 years since getting my gun and badge. I've loved every minute of the job. Thanks to my father, I've met all kinds of twisted and dangerous deranged people though. But I've never felt scared. Every encounter with them just made my desire to protect and serve stronger. That's why the only time I've ever actually felt fear was when I was confronted with something non-human. It's something I still can't explain today. It happened sometime in August. Me and my partner were in our car, and we got a call over the radio from an address not far from us. A man calling 911 claimed there was an intruder in his house. We rushed to the address as fast as possible and got to the front door. There was no sign of a forced entry, but the door was unlocked, so we very slowly went inside and began scouting the house. After a couple of minutes, there was only one room left that we did not clear, and the door was locked. And we stated that we were the police, and the owner of the house opened the door, coming out of the bathroom with a knife in his hands. As soon as he saw us, he looked relieved and put down the weapon. He explained that he lives there alone, and he heard a door in the house open and close just before he fled, walking himself in the bathroom. There wasn't really much we could do to help. We looked around for any shoe prints or tracks or fingerprints, but nothing. There was no sign of anybody coming in. We advised him to lock the door and call us again if anything happened or if he saw anything. We were gonna head back. That same night, the dispatcher got a call from the same address and again, it was the same man claiming somebody is inside the house trying to break in the bathroom door. 
He truly sounded sincere and looked worried. This time, the front door was locked and we had to break in. But after scouting the house again, we did not find anybody inside. Also, no signs of a forced entry either. When the man came out of the bathroom, he was pale and looked rather terrified. After we talked to him again, my partner and I went outside and discussed the situation in private. We were absolutely sure nobody else could have been in the house. But we also agreed he doesn't look like he is making things up or crazy or delusional. He was your average 40-year-old man. We concluded that he might be delusional though, so we decided to go through his medical records to see if we can dig up anything in his past. Perhaps there was a possibility of mental illness. We did not learn anything that would support this idea. But we did find something very strange. This man in the past had reported his wife missing about a week earlier. Police still had not found her. I asked around a little bit. I could not find much. Something was off about all of it. I could not sleep that night thinking about everything. We had checked multiple records and after time, discovered that he didn't try to contact the police or anything about his wife since the day he had reported her missing. He was becoming more and more suspicious. So one evening, I decided to stake out at his house to see if I can find out anything. I parked my personal vehicle nearby and waited. Around midnight, the police got a call again. It was from the same man claiming somebody was inside. I've been outside his house now for the last couple of hours and was definitely sure nobody got in or out. A little bit after the call, I could see a silhouette walking around the house. I contacted the dispatcher. He told them he was hiding in the bathroom. I was completely puzzled and clueless about what is happening, so I decided to go inside alone instead of waiting for backup. I was certain somebody was going to walk in the house. I picked a lock and slowly made my way inside, sneaking around. I could hear somebody banging on the door of the bathroom. When I got closer, nobody was there, and the only sound was the man crying in the bathroom. I managed to get him to come out and sat down to talk to him. I assured him that I believe that something is going on, confronting him about his missing wife. As soon as I mentioned her, his expression and demeanor changed completely. He didn't look sad, just some sort of worried, and said that she had been gone now for a while. He didn't get any news or updates from the police. Something was off about the entire situation, but I could not put my finger on it, not yet. We had finished the conversation. I told him I will come back again to ask some more questions and began to leave the house. He remained sitting on the sofa. I was almost out the front door when I heard steps behind me. I thought he was following me, but when I turned around, he wasn't there. Instead, I saw a figure in a white dress approaching him. I pulled out my gun and slowly pointed it at the figure. When the man noticed the silhouette as well, he let out a horrifying scream. At first, after the scream, I could hear him mumbling something about being impossible, and I heard him apologize. He was screaming that he is sorry. I was completely puzzled. Then things became even more strange and unexplainable. The figure in the white dress grabbed the man by his neck and began choking him. I began to yell, commanding it to stop, but it did not listen. I took a shot aiming at the shoulder, but the bullet passed right through it. And now I'm scared and confused. So I mindlessly fire three more rounds and all of them ended up going straight through. I charged with my body to grab the person or thing and went through it as well, hitting into the wall. My mind could not comprehend what had happened. I looked up. The figure was clearly a woman. Her face was expressionless and she did not speak. She stood there choking the man before my very eyes. I could not do anything. I called for backup on my radio but pretty soon the man on the sofa had collapsed. The woman in the white dress released his body and began walking away towards the yard. I stood up, checked the man's pulse. He wasn't breathing. He was dead. So I decided to follow the woman. She walked away slowly without making a sound toward the tree in the garden 
and then finally vanishing. When I got to the tree, I saw the dirt under it that it was different than the rest of the garden. I began digging with my bare hands. After a little while, the stench. I began digging even faster and discovered a body, rather a head to be more precise. The skin was already decomposing and half the flesh was devoured. When the paramedics arrived, they examined the man and could see my pile of vomit right next to it. After I'd found it, the reason of death was concluded to be asphyxiation, but there were no visible marks that would indicate somebody had strangled him. The only thing paramedics could conclude is that he had stopped breathing. But I know what happened. I don't know how it's possible, but I am certain that the ghost of his dead wife I sound so ridiculous even typing this out, but the ghost of his dead wife that was buried in the yard came back and had its revenge. For the rest of the police and doctors, this man's death will stay a mystery. I will not say what I saw. I would have my badge revoked and be sent off to the loony bin. Nobody would believe me. But after this, I believe that paranormal and ghosts are very, very real. I had just enlisted in the Forest Service in 26 and was working in the Algonquin Park for the summer time. I never understood why they paid me as little as they did for all the things I had to deal with. To give you some more context, the Algonquin Park is this massive wildlife preserve full of moose, black bears, elk, etc. And this is why it makes it such an excellent tourist trap. We're always finding weird things too, like tracks and scat, which is pretty normal, but not when you find human-looking scat in four times the size. That's when things begin to get very unnerving. In fact, I had several people on a trail, a very popular trail, which name and route I won't mention, but they had reported seeing very large piles of human scat along the side. After being disgusted, thinking somebody could not wait to find the bathroom, or was just simply going in the great outdoors far too close to a road that people travel after inspection, this was far larger than any human could produce. Also around the scat pile were these massive footprints that were evidently from a bipedal being. Nearby these prints are large blackberry bushes, meaning that whatever was around here was probably eating berries and doing its business. I never thought Bigfoot was a possibility, but the more and more I see this kind of stuff, the more evidence I'm exposed to, the more I'm becoming a believer, I should say. The Alaskan wilderness has a way of swallowing you whole, embracing you in its icy grip and challenging your very existence. It's a place where only the strongest survive, where solitude becomes your closest companion. I'm Jack Turner, a rugged individualist who has carved out a life of seclusion in a rustic cabin nestled deep within this unforgiving landscape. My days are defined by the rhythm of self-sufficiency. Chopping wood becomes a meditation, each swing of the axe a reminder of my resilience. Hunting provides sustenance, a reminder that I am a part of this wild world, and the tranquility that only isolation can offer becomes my solace, my refuge from a world that seems to grow more chaotic with each passing day. As the days grow shorter and the winter months stretch on, the snow-covered landscape closes in around me. The howling wind becomes a haunting symphony and the dance of snowflakes outside my window is both mesmerizing and isolating. I find comfort in the routine and the simple acts that tether me to reality. But one evening, as the wind's howl grew louder and the snowflakes danced with newfound intensity, something shifted. I peered through the frosty window of my cabin and caught a glimpse of movement among the trees. At first, I dismissed it as a trick of my imagination an illusion conjured by the isolation and the long hours spent in the quiet wilderness. Yet, as the days passed, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. Glimpses of the same dark, hulking shape appeared on the periphery of my vision, always just out of reach. It was a presence that seemed to defy explanation, a feeling that crawled beneath my skin and nestled in the pit of my stomach. I hesitated to share my experiences with the outside world, who would believe me? 
a lone man living in the heart of the wilderness. But I couldn't ignore the unsettling truth any longer. I began journaling my encounters, documenting every detail, every chilling observation. My descriptions painted a vivid picture a towering figure covered in matted fur, eyes that gleamed with an otherworldly intelligence, and a presence that sent shivers down my spine. As the creature's appearances grew more frequent, my skepticism wavered. My rational mind clashed with the inexplicable reality I was facing. The isolation that had once brought me solace now deepened my uncertainty. I questioned the very foundation of my reality, grappling with the idea that there was more to this world than met the eye. Desperation drove me to seek answers in the stories of native Alaskan legends. Tales of similar creatures that inhabited the wilds echoed in the back of my mind, offering a sliver of validation for the inexplicable horrors I had witnessed. A turning point came during a stormy night when the wind howled like a banshee and the snow swirled in a frenzy. With a heart pounding in my chest, I mustered the courage to confront the creature that had haunted my every waking moment. Armed with a flashlight and a camera, I ventured into the blizzard, determined to capture evidence of the elusive being that had invaded my world. And there, at the edge of the clearing, my flashlight's beam illuminated an imposing figure. Its features were obscured by the swirling snow, yet I felt its presence reverberate through my very being. In those fleeting moments as I snapped photos in the blinding storm, I knew that what I had witnessed defied all logic. In the aftermath, I shared my story with a trusted friend and a researcher who treated my experiences with raw honesty. Despite my initial hesitation, I knew I had to speak my truth. With conviction, I declared, Bigfoot is real, and I wouldn't lie about it. My account ignited a blend of fascination and skepticism among those who heard my tale, blurring the line between reality and the unexplainable. As I look out at the snow-covered expanse that surrounds my cabin, I am reminded that some mysteries are destined to remain hidden in the heart of the wilderness. The world may doubt my story, but I carry with me the knowledge that I have stared into the abyss and witnessed something that transcends understanding. The Alaskan wilderness is a place of wonder and terror, a realm where the line between reality and myth blurs, and the truth is as elusive as the creatures that roam its depths. Growing up, I remember my father telling me stories about his days as a logger. He was a strong, hard-working man, and he loved his job. But there was one story he would tell that always left me with a sense of unease, a story about a strange encounter he had in the woods. It was late autumn, and the logging season was coming to a close. My father and his crew were working hard to finish up their last few jobs before the winter snows arrived. One evening, as the sun dipped below the horizon, my father decided to head back to camp early to prepare dinner for the crew. As he drove along the winding forest road, he suddenly spotted a large, hairy man dart out of the woods and across the road just a few feet in front of his truck. My father slammed on the brakes, his heart racing in his chest as he tried to make sense of what he had just seen. The creature was massive, covered in thick, matted hair and running on two legs like a human but with a speed and agility that seemed almost unnatural. As quickly as it had appeared, the creature vanished into the woods on the other side of the road. My father sat in his truck, his hands gripping the steering wheel tightly as he tried to process what he had just witnessed. He knew he couldn't keep this to himself, so he drove back to the logging site and told his fellow lumberjacks what had happened. To his surprise, many of them believed his story, they had heard whispers of strange creatures living in the woods, creatures that were not quite human, but not quite animal either. Together, they decided to form a search party and see if they could find any trace of the creature my father had encountered. Armed with flashlights and a sense of determination, they set off into the woods, following the path the creature had taken as it crossed the road. They searched for hours, their flashlights casting eerie shadows among the trees, but they found no sign of the creature. As the night wore on and the temperature dropped, 
they eventually decided to abandon their search and return to camp. My father couldn't shake the feeling that the creature was still out there, watching them from the shadows, but he knew there was little they could do to find it. The story of my father's encounter with the strange, hairy man spread throughout the logging community, and while some dismissed it as a tall tale or a trick of the light, others believed it to be true. My father never saw the creature again, but the memory of that night stayed with him for the rest of his life. As I grew older, I found myself wondering about the mysterious creature that had crossed my father's path all those years ago. Was it a figment of his imagination, or could it have been something more? I suppose I'll never know the truth, but the story remains a haunting reminder of the mysteries that still lurk within the depths of the forest. My brother is two years older, and we've probably spent 10,000 hours and then some in the woods together. Whether it was building Fort's BMX tracks to LARPing and hunting, we've traveled across the U.S. exploring caves, canyons, cliff diving, mountain biking, camping, hunting whitetail, mule deer, wild boar, etc. since 2016 when we get the time off. I feel like adding this is important because there's genuinely nothing I wouldn't do or fear when I have him by my side, but this time was different, and we both felt it. We've had our fair share of adventures and stories to tell of all sorts, but this one has felt like a lingering stain on my memory. We were both mid-twenties-ish, and it was 2019, and this was probably my fifth time hunting the area and the first I brought my brother along. It's a large forest area of public land that has a few county roads which are basically two tracks that stretch miles throughout the area. We make the trip up in my truck with our tents, three in total, one for each of us and another to change in and keep our gear in. Without making this long-winded, we set up camp a couple miles from the truck, which we drove for quite a few miles through the trails. Basically middle of nowhere, nearest main road is probably 8-10 miles away. We arrived late in the night, set up camp and quickly fell asleep after a long trip. We then spent the next day scouting tracking then made back to camp for the night. We cooked then ate, had some beers and bullshitted. The night was still early, but we had a long day and decided to head off for the night. Everything up until this point was normal. I was suddenly awoke to something smacking my tent and hearing my brother's voice call my name. I knew something was off. I called back to him and he immediately unzipped my tent and made his way inside. I could tell he was disturbed when I went to ask him what's wrong and he immediately grabbed my shoulder and told me to shush. The sun wasn't up yet so I think it was around 4.35 ish am. We sat in my tent and what we heard still confuses me to this day. I can only explain it as whale sounds different tones of extremely loud noise that I could feel throughout my body. It would come and go, but there would only be a few seconds of silence in between the sounds. It would vary from high-pitched squeals and everything in between to very low sounds that had literal ground-shaking reverb. I regrettably didn't think to grab my phone or record anything that was going on, because what I was hearing didn't seem real, and in the moment I was awestruck. The sound went on until daylight started to break. I believe it was about an hour, but I'm not really sure. Neither of us spoke, and at the time it felt like I could feel the energy around me almost like my body was covered in white noise, if that makes any sense. It wasn't even minutes after the sound stopped it started to rain, and one of the craziest thunderstorms while I was camping happened. The forecast didn't predict or account for any rain the days we were going to be there prior to making the trip. All the stakes for the tent our gear was in completely ripped out of the ground and both of our tents had multiple stakes ripped out as well. Those things were drove into the ground with an axe and would take some insane force to unearth even a single one. My brother dismisses it and won't even talk about it saying it was just machinery being dragged but at the time we both shared the same feeling of fear and dread. Just seems odd it was still the middle of the night, and we were so far removed from any nearby community's industry to hear and experience this occurrence.
A 27 female live in a small town in North Italy, a valley between our typical old mountains round shapes, covered in forest, not high, so just behind my home lots of hikes start. I always lived here and I like mountains, plus I'm getting in shape so the terrain is ideal, especially because I'm really familiar with it. So, last summer I was walking my usual route when I thought I could try to have a short hike before sunset, and took a route. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with Italian ground, but there aren't the big spaces and long distances typically of US I imagine. Picture the average small town of 2500 people, starting from bottom in a two hour hike here on top of the mountain, and the route I took was about 30 minutes to arrive halfway the mountain to a big Christian cross and a nice view. I was with my dog, a well-trained Spitz, a nice company with good instincts that I trust. He's a working dog more than a pet, despite his size. So we took the path and start making our way up, nice and relaxed, but active as we didn't have too much light time left. I just figured that if light went low, I'd just turn around and head home, no chances of getting lost. Woods immediately engulf us, pretty dense, but it's the norm. Not even 15 minutes of walking, and I'm paralyzed with this overwhelming sense of dread. The woods are completely silent. My skin crawls up just thinking about it. Even my dog stops, anxious. I just couldn't understand what was scaring me so much in the sudden silence. I couldn't move a muscle. I've read The Gift of Fear, and the only time I didn't listen to my guts, I lost my spleen in an accident. So wide-eyed and hyper-alert, I forced myself to move and noped out of there. It was like my brain was screaming, If you stay here, you'll die. Walking back, I couldn't stop the urge to continuously look behind me. At some point, I was practically running, and I kept thinking that if I sprained an ankle there, I would die. The dog seemed relieved when we had turned back, and he kept looking behind too. When we finally made it out of the woods and back on the road, I felt a wave of relief and ran all the way back home for the adrenaline I had. To this day, I don't know what happened and I haven't gone back. We were just doing our usual training exercise. I'm Sergeant Thompson part of a National Guard unit running routine maneuvers in a heavily forested area near a small, secluded town. We were only supposed to be there for a few days, but those few days turned into something I'll never forget. Our first clue something was off was when we found the bodies. They were mauled, torn apart in ways that no normal animal could manage. The townsfolk were terrified, and we quickly found ourselves taking on a role we'd never anticipated protectors against something far from routine. The local sheriff told us about the legends, about creatures that roamed the woods when the moon was full. Werewolves, he said, half joking, half believing. We laughed it off at first. But then, as night fell and the full moon rose, we heard the howls. They were unlike anything I'd ever heard, a chilling mix of man and beast, echoing through the quiet forest. Our laughter quickly faded. Suddenly, the legends didn't seem so funny. We rallied our unit, prepping our military equipment. We were soldiers, trained to handle any threat, even if that threat was straight out of a horror movie. The townsfolk were counting on us, and we weren't about to let them down. The werewolves came as the night deepened. They were swift and brutal, their movements almost a blur under the silver moonlight. Their howls filled the air, their eyes glowed in the darkness. They were terrifying, but we stood our ground. We fought with everything we had. Our bullets seemed to only slow them down, but we kept firing, kept fighting. We used our military training to strategize, to coordinate our attacks. We set traps, created choke points, and used the town's layout to our advantage. The battle was fierce, and we lost some good men and women that night but we also saved lives. We protected the town's residents, helped them survive the night. And as dawn approached, the howls faded and the werewolves retreated. We were left standing amidst the quiet town, the full moon setting, and the first rays of sunlight peeking over the horizon. 
We were bruised and battered, but we were victorious. We'd protected the town, neutralized the threat. The following days were a blur of reports and debriefings. Our superiors were skeptical, but the evidence was undeniable. We were hailed as heroes by the town's folk, their gratitude evident in their tear-streaked faces. That training mission turned into something none of us could have ever predicted. It changed us, made us realize just how unpredictable our world could be. We faced down werewolves under a full moon, and we lived to tell the tale. And now, every time the moon is full, I can't help but listen for the howls. There's a certain charm to living in the desert boonies, a charm that's often lost on those who've never experienced the vast emptiness, the silence, and the solitude it offers. My girlfriend lived out there, in a small house surrounded by an endless expanse of sand and shrubs. I'd often spend nights with her, enjoying the peace that the desert night brought. But there was a catch to living in such seclusion. Her house was near a state penitentiary, a place notorious for its frequent escapees. This was back in the day, long before cell phones and digital alerts became commonplace. So the only way the authorities would inform us about a prison break was through police helicopters flying overhead, blaring messages from megaphones. I remember one night distinctly. The desert was quiet, the sky was clear, and we had just drifted off to sleep when we were abruptly awakened by a deafening roar. A police helicopter was flying over our house, its searchlight piercing through the darkness, and a voice was screaming at us from the sky. Attention, attention. An inmate has escaped from the state penitentiary. Please stay indoors and make sure all your doors and windows are locked. In the silence of the desert night, the sound was jarring, even terrifying. We bolted out of bed, hearts pounding in our chests, and ran around the house, checking all the locks and windows, ensuring they were secure. The helicopter continued its rounds, the voice echoed in the desert, repeating its warning. We huddled together in the living room, waiting for the commotion to die down, waiting for the silence to return. Those were good times in their own strange way. They were times that tested our courage, times that broke the monotony of our desert life, times that brought us closer together. We were never in any real danger, but the adrenaline, the fear, the excitement, they all made our life out there in the desert boonies a little more thrilling, a little more adventurous. And looking back, I wouldn't have had it any other way. In 1999, I was seven years old, playing in the woods with my friend Charlotte. We were standing at each end of a big log in the woods when I noticed movement in my peripherals. I tried focusing my periphery to catch a detailed look I see similar movement often when we're in the woods, and always disappears more like scatters before I turn to look. My heart skipped a beat when I could make out a group of little people looking up at me as well. I was frozen in the pose I was playing in. After a few seconds, I realized Charlotte had stopped narrating out play and was frozen in place as well, staring at me but focusing on them. I'm pretty sure they were dressed because it didn't look like they were all naked. I could tell they knew we were aware of them, and they dispersed as Charlotte moved her eyes. We didn't talk about it until we were in her house. We weren't afraid, just confused on our walk home. We wrote out what we saw before talking about it, to see if we saw the same thing. Unfortunately, both our descriptions were so vague, but clothed, less than a foot for sure. One thing we were positive of was to mind our business and to not go searching, which is what our instinct would have usually been. Duh, we thought we found a colony of little people in the woods. But the fact that our reaction was to quietly leave and not even talk about it until behind closed doors, and still not even talk out loud but write it. I don't remember being too frightened, in fact we kind of just accepted it and moved on with a new taste of what this world, universe is capable of. I watched the Indian in the cupboard later in life which reminded me of these little people, but I no longer saw them by then. 
Charlotte and I would talk about seeing things out of the corner of our eyes, but could never figure out what it was. Although Charlotte was different, her and her dad were huge hippies tire swing in the kitchen, no TV, and her imagination was so wildly magnificent that it made my mind radiate. I always thought that maybe her narration of our play was so powerful and energetic that we could manifest and see the same thing. Little people were never playing any parts in either of our imaginations, in fact, when we both confirmed what each other saw, we were kind of in awe that we've never even dreamt of tiny people on this universe. My ex-boyfriend was Navajo, and he used to share countless stories from his culture and his childhood with me. One in particular still sends shivers down my spine. When he was a kid, he and his sister loved to play in the dense woodland that bordered their house. They were inseparable, always lost in some grand adventure, a world of their own making. But one day, something strange happened that abruptly ended their woodland escapades. They were deep in their usual game when an eerie feeling washed over them. The woods, usually teeming with sounds of life, fell eerily silent. It was as if the forest itself was holding its breath. Something felt off, but they couldn't quite put their fingers on it. Rattled, they decided to cut their playtime short and rushed home. Their concern was evident, and it didn't go unnoticed by their parents, who decided to seek the counsel of a respected medicine man in their community. The medicine man listened to their story, his face growing more serious as they explained what had happened. When they finished, he nodded sagely and told them, Little people have been watching you as you played. The woods are their home, and you have intruded on their space. It's best not to play over there anymore. The term he used to describe these beings was something like Digini men, a phrase that always seemed to catch in my ex's throat as he said it, his eyes filled with a memory of that day. I've tried to find more information about these Digini men, but my efforts have proved fruitless. Still, the story has stayed with me, a reminder of the unseen world that could very well exist just beyond our perception, right there in the untouched corners of the forest. When I was a teenager around 2004, we used to sneak down through a quiet area of scrub over the dunes onto the beach to smoke weed. I lived in a very small coastal town on the mid-north coast of New South Wales. Typical wildlife was possums, wallabies, and maybe the occasional kangaroo. Definitely no dingoes, crocs, or other apex predators around. One night as we quietly made our way down the path, we noticed a shuffling, rustling sound in the undergrowth near the path. We stopped moving, and the sound seemed to stop as well. There was absolutely zero light, except from some houses in the distance and the moon. After a brief pause, we decided to keep moving. We heard the rustling sound again, and this time noticed some bushes moving. We stopped and my friend whispered, Holy shit, did anyone else see the trees move? I whispered back. I only saw the bushes move. We stood there frozen for a few beats in my head. I was weighing up the option to either continue on the path or leg it back home. We took a few more steps forward when we heard the sound like leaves crunching underfoot. At this point, I reached out and grabbed my friend's hand, thinking maybe we were being followed by someone. It was right then I noticed I could smell something awful. What the F is that smell? My mate whispered. His voice came out so small it frightened me even more. We stood there for so long, but probably only a minute or two until we heard a low groan growl sound coming from a few meters away. Now brushtail possums are quite common to the area, and are known to make a kind of grunting coughing sound, but they are from the ones I've ever heard, distinctly higher pitched and more chirpy sounding than what we heard. This was a low and more sonorous sound, kind of like er, with some strange catching tish sounds at the end. Needless to say, we wordlessly booked it straight back up the path the way we came. It sounded to me like a huge commotion of leaves crunching and branches shaking and crashing behind us as we ran, but reflecting on it with my adult hindsight, 
It definitely could have been us making all that noise. We never went back to that spot again, and would bring it up from time to time, trying to speculate what could have followed us that night. Our best theories were that it was just a bloody big possum, or a person trying to scare us. The biggest issues we would argue over was why would a possum follow us, let alone down on the ground, although my mate says he saw the tree branches move as well, and if it was a person, how did they make that sound? And what was the smell? And why didn't we hear any footfall? Maybe it was just a coincidence of events. A person following us, a nearby possum growling, and a nearby dead animal stink wafting over at just the right moment. It still makes me shiver to think about it now. Six years ago, when I was only 12, an experience shook me to my core. i just returned home from school and was enjoying my lunch in front of the TV. Both my parents were out, and my grandmother was fast asleep in her room. As I sat there engrossed in my favorite cartoon, something in the room adjacent to the TV caught my attention from the corner of my eye. At first, I tried to dismiss it as my imagination, keeping my focus glued to the screen. But soon, I felt a movement in that room. When I turned my head, my heart nearly leapt out of my chest. I saw the teeth of a person, wide open in a terrifying grin. It was a woman, or at least that's what it looked like. A black figure, smiling at me. My heart pounded in my chest, and for a moment I was paralyzed by fear. I stared at her for what felt like an eternity, but was probably only five seconds. Then she started moving towards me. That was my breaking point. Fight or flight kicked in, and I bolted towards the room, slammed the door shut, and dashed out into the backyard. Outside, my breath came in ragged gasps. I kept glancing at the house, peering through every door and window, scared that the figure might follow me. It took me a good ten minutes to calm down. When I finally gathered the courage to go back inside, I found the door to the room still closed. I checked on my grandmother. She was still asleep, oblivious to the ordeal I'd just experienced. I wanted to wake her up, but I couldn't bring myself to do it. I returned to my spot in front of the TV, my gaze locked onto the screen but my mind elsewhere, grappling with the terror I'd just experienced. When my parents arrived home later, I finally felt a bit safer. I called up my friend and spilled out the entire incident to him. Surprisingly, as time passed, the incident faded from my memory. I never told my parents about it until a month ago when a scene from a horror movie brought the memory rushing back. They brushed it off as a dream since I'd kept it a secret for six years, but my friend remembered my frantic call that day. To this day, I don't know what I saw. Was it a spirit? A hallucination? I've tried to rationalize it, but the memory remains vivid and real. After that day, I never encountered anything similar again, except for a strange occurrence last week. But that's a story for another time. On Monday, May 9th, 2011, around 5.45 a.m., I was on my way to work headed northbound into the village of New Miami on Seven Mile Avenue. I left the traffic light at the southernmost edge of town into a dark stretch of road when a large flying creature swooped in over my car and snatched up a small animal in the road ahead of me at the edge of my headlights. As a construction worker, I feel I can judge the size of objects fairly well. This creature had a wingspan of at least 12 feet and was jet black with a human figure. It completely blocked the view out of my windshield and then someone moved at a very high rate of speed. I was traveling between 35-40 miles per hour. It had to have been traveling at around 70-80 miles per hour. Like I stated before, it swooped down, grabbed the animal, and was gone over the trees very quickly. I've researched large predator birds and raptors indigenous to Ohio, and there are none that fit the description of what I saw. If you have any other questions about my experience, please feel free to email me back.
It was June 15, 1994, a day that I still remember vividly. I was camping with my friends in the deep wilderness. The night had a coolness to it, the kind you only get when you're far away from the city lights and the sounds of civilization. There we were, tucked away in our camp, when something happened that would stay with me forever. Around midnight, I heard the sound of a large animal walking through our camp. It was coming from the dense forest, its footfalls heavy and distinct. I knew enough about the wilderness to know not to provoke a large animal, so I stayed quiet, alert, and let it pass. I listened as the sound slowly receded, the animal moving away from our camp. At five in the morning, my campmates and I gathered around the smoldering embers of our fire, sharing our experiences of the previous night. One of them even accused me of being the animal, saying he had seen a human silhouette at the time we all heard the sounds. It was a ridiculous accusation, but it added to the eeriness of the situation. Half an hour later, I was about a mile downstream when I heard a loud commotion in the gravel of a ten-foot cut bank. Thinking it was my friend playing a prank, I walked towards the noise. But as I got closer, a horrific smell hit me, something I had never smelled before. It was pungent, rotting far worse than any animal scent I had ever encountered, even worse than my old dog on his smelliest day. I picked up a few rocks and threw them towards the source of the sound, hoping to scare off whatever was there. But nothing moved. Nothing ran off like a normal animal would. The smell hung in the air, the commotion stopped, and everything was eerily silent. I remember standing there, the hair on the back of my neck standing up, a chill running down my spine. I was an experienced camper, a seasoned hunter, but that day I encountered something that I couldn't explain, something that challenged my understanding of the natural world. It's an experience that I'll never forget, a story that I still tell around campfires, under the starlit sky, reminding myself and others of the mysteries that the wilderness still holds. I've always had an affinity for the cold, which is why I sleep with the windows open, even in winter. My apartment is nestled high enough, about three stories off the ground, ensuring that the chill winds are my only nocturnal visitors. Where I live, deer move about mostly at night, and their soft footsteps rustling through the fallen leaves have become my usual lullaby. It was eerie at first, but over the years, I've grown accustomed to it. One night, however, something sounded amiss. Amidst the usual patter of deer hooves, there was a new, distinct rustle something fast, something unnatural. A sudden alarm snort rang out, followed by frantic thuds, as if the deer were scattering in terror. Then came the barking, a cacophony of distress calls, and sounds of dragging and snorting that sent shivers down my spine. Underneath my blanket, my palms were sweaty, my heartbeat echoing in my ears. I was paralyzed with fear, my mind conjuring up images of unknown horrors lurking beneath my window. The noises eventually faded into an eerie silence, and I mustered the courage to close the windows, barricading myself from the ominous unknown. Sleep came hesitantly, the echoes of the night's terror still fresh in my ears. When dawn broke, I ventured outside. There was little evidence of the nocturnal chaos, just some fresh dirt, displaced in the deer's frantic escape. But that night taught me some valuable lessons, ones that will forever resonate with me. Never venture into the woods without a lamp and a gun, and if you must, never go alone. The woods have their secrets, secrets that are best left undiscovered in the dead of the night. Growing up in the heart of rural southeast Kansas was an adventure in itself. My childhood was filled with the thrill of exploring the great outdoors, traversing the tall grass prairies, and adventuring into the unknown with my friends. Our ages ranged from 10 to 14, and our ventures were led by youthful curiosity, armed only with pellet and BB guns, and maybe a knife for good measure. On one such adventure, we set out after dusk towards a shallow creek that meandered through a small forest about a mile from my best friend's house. 
The thrill of the nocturnal expedition had us buzzing with excitement, but that excitement was soon replaced with an unnerving sensation. The deeper we ventured into the woods, the more we felt an eerie sense of being watched. An inexplicable feeling that something was trailing us, hidden in the inkai blackness of the night. Despite our efforts, we couldn't spot what was triggering our primal instincts. A sense of dread washed over us, and instinctively we huddled together, facing outward, each one of us on high alert. Deciding that we had had enough of the woods for the night, we bolted out of the forest, our feet crunching the dried leaves, hearts pounding. As we emerged into the tall grass prairie that led back to the house, I dared to glance back at the tree line. There I caught a glimpse of what seemed like a mountain lion's tail disappearing into a bush. The sight sent a shiver down my spine, and I quickly urged my friends to stay close as we made our way back home. Once safe, we confided in my friend's father, who worked for the local parks and rec department and was well acquainted with the fish and game personnel. Officially, we were told that there were no big cats in southeast Kansas. However, he shared that there had been some whispers about a potentially untracked male mountain lion in the area. From that day onwards, our adventures held a hint of trepidation, a constant reminder of the wild and unpredictable nature of the world we so eagerly sought to explore. I am turning 30 in a few months, and I can still recall so vividly the three shadow people I encountered in my home somewhere between the ages of 8 and 12. A little background on me. I moved to a small town upstate, New York at around 7 years old. When this happened, my mother had recently just departed from my father kicked him out lol. My family had a weird vibe pretty much. I wasn't close with my older sister and we were one year apart. My youngest sister I don't believe was born yet, so it was just us three and my mom. My brother had a best friend that lived up the street, and I'd describe us as Ed, Ed and Eddie, lol just three young kids causing havoc around the neighborhood. Also if it counts for anything, we grew up very Christian family especially on mom's side, but when we moved we stopped going to church as often. One of my sweetest grandmother memories. I recall when I was young, before we would leave my grandmother's house in the city of New Arcaio, she would anoint us with oil on our foreheads and say a prayer before we left to go back home upstate. Anyway, I remember it being like any other day. We played outside, Game Boy Color or Advance, I don't know, traded Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh cards and just had fun all day long. We came in, showered and settled down. I guess it was probably summer when school was out because I was up late and my sister was too, but I didn't know this at the time. My brother was knocked out next to me with his head facing the wall, and I was on the other edge of the bed with my head facing the door to his room which was wide open. My brother and I were so close man which explains why I was making myself comfortable in his room. It was pretty much a real brotherly bond I would say and I kind of get emotional thinking about it because nothing was ever the same since that day. Anyway, I'm laying there just trying to go to sleep I guess, and I just get this odd feeling that I'm being watched. All of the lights were off, and we were no longer in a city environment where there is light even in darkness. Upstate NY is dark dark when the lights go out especially in the house. From my brother's doorway, the hallway made an L shape. If you turn right and walk down the hall, there was my sister's room, also my room at the time, or you can go straight ahead towards the stairs. Obviously, I'm staring straight ahead towards the stairs. I'm staring now because I can't sleep with this odd F feeling. And within seconds, a tall shadow began to appear in the distance on the stairs, and it was freaky. Because man, you can see the outline of this thing in the pitch dark. Blackness. This thing was blacker than the blackness itself, and the eyes were the only thing that I could really see. His outline was tall, he had a tall hat, and he was just skinny with long looking fingers. Now my heart is pounding, and I'm pretty much thinking WTF is going on. So I start blinking nervously because I didn't believe I was seeing this. 
As I blinked, the other two appeared closer than the last one. They were no longer on the stairs, but in the hallway. One wore a hood and carried what seemed like a stick, sort of like the Grim Reaper. And the other one was large, like wide and fat. The eyes were large and just gave me a bad up feeling. I literally laid there in fear, and I tried to refrain from blinking at one point, because it seemed like every time I blinked, they got closer. I promise you, the tears were flowing, and I made the mistake of blinking, and it was like they just appeared right in the doorway. And that's when I couldn't hold my fear in any longer man. I let out the most excruciating scream. I was scared for dear life, I felt like those things were going to kill me. I just started screaming loud and my mother was heavy-footed man. All I heard was her come stomping from her room at the end of the hall and into the hall. She flipped on the hallway light switch and came running stomping into the room. I swear it was like an elephant coming to save her baby man. My mom is such graceful woman I promise lol, but I always remember her being so heavy-footed when she would move around the home probably because she was often rushing everywhere. I guess raising kids will do that to ya lol, but man that day felt like no other. She scooped me up and took me back to her room, and was just consoling me asking me what the hell happened. She was scared that I was scared. But I was out of it. It took me a while to calm down and explain to her what I saw. I wasn't only afraid of her reaction, but I was always a thinker back then and even now. I just thought at the time even if I told her what could she do. It's not like she could beat them up or something because I knew that whatever those things were just wasn't from this world or realm. It was really odd and terrifying. It had to be like 2 or 3 am at the time, and I remember her picking up the phone and calling my grandmother who was and still is a hardcore Christian. She called and they spoke. I remember her trying to leave the room and I would squeal because I didn't want to be left without the lights on. Her room light was still off, but she ended up turning it on for my comfort and leaving the room to speak to my grandmother. She came back shortly after with what I perceived as a bottle of water back then, but as I know now, it was holy water. I watched my mother bless her entire room and then leave her room to run through the entire home and bless it too. I saw her splashing the bottle on the walls and everything. I remember sleeping in my mom's room for months after that. I couldn't sleep anywhere else, I was traumatized. I never saw those things again after that day, but I had some wild experiences in life after that. The oddest thing was that my brother slept through it all, not waking up once. Doesn't recall the day or anything. Since then, he's had so many hardships in life and has been in and out of jail and crazy outbursts. I don't know if it's connected, but I just felt a shift in his being after that day. The next day I remember having breakfast, and my older sister asking me why I was screaming last night. Embarrassed off course lol, I told her what I saw, but I was shocked when she just stared at me and said, I saw it too. I remember thinking to myself, well, if you saw it too, then why the F wasn't you screaming? LOL, but I never discredited her, nor mentioned it again. She just turned 31, and I'm turning 30 as I told you above, so I'm thinking about revisiting this experience by calling her and asking her if she remembers, and I think it would be dope to get that moment on voice record. It's crazy because I recently revisited this conversation with my mother, and she confirmed it all and was surprised I even remembered. I couldn't forget something that traumatic. Remember I told you my brother had a best friend that lived up the street, and we were all like Ed, Ed and Eddie. Well, about two or three years ago, he came to visit me for an extended period of time. I was living in a TL with my girlfriend in our new apartment. I made him comfy and at home obviously because he's my brother too just from another mother and father law. We then we started chatting about our childhood memories. Our adult relationship is completely different than our childhood ones. My brother and him are still best friends, but they are on two different paths in life. He now has a child and a long-term girlfriend, he moved across the country, he has a career, and he's doing really good for himself. My brother is still navigating life, 
Emotionally underdeveloped, I'd say, and a bit lost at the moment. So their relationship is more moral support. A friend that's going to always be their type thing, if that makes sense. Whereas him and I have the more difficult and in-depth conversations. I remember us talking about conspiracy theories, spirituality, political crap, our fathers being Freemasons and stuff like that, and it later led to talking about spirits and shadow people. I remember him telling me, man, just don't think I'm crazy when I tell you this, and then went on to tell me how he saw some tall figure in his house when he used to live up the street from me as a child. And for some odd reason at that time I asked him if the figure was a skinny guy. And he said, skinny with a tall hat and long fingers. I swear we both had like a twin telepathy moment, and at that moment we both knew that we experienced one of the same entities. He told me his story, and I told him mine, and we both just sat there disturbed. It was weird and creepy, and even unto this day we phone each other up and talk about the crazy experiences we had, and are still having in this world today. So one night I'm driving home from a friend's place. It's pretty late, like two or three in the morning. I live in the suburbs and the streets are relatively tight, so I am typically driving pretty slow don't speed in your neighborhood. Happy neighbors are good neighbors. I'm nearing the turn to enter my close, and from a distance I see what looks to be someone outside. Pretty unusual this time of night as it's all young families and retirees around me. As I get closer it's definitely a kid which is even stranger like, doesn't this kid have parents? They're standing directly under the street light with a raincoat on not raining and their hood up over their head so that the shadow cast completely covers their face. I know my neighborhood pretty well and while I don't know most by name, you know who has kids and who doesn't. This corner house 100% doesn't have any kids. That kid's gaze was locked onto my truck, unwavering, turning their head and staring straight at me as I slowly pass, turning right towards my house this kid only a few feet away. This kid did a full 180 with their body and watched me drive down my street. While I only live six or so houses into the close, it's just enough I lost sight of the kid. It was super unsettling. I couldn't even quite explain to you the feeling I got from it. I back into my driveway, put my truck in park, think about what I saw and say F it. I've got to check this out back into drive and back down the street, maybe twenty seconds tops since I passed and kids gone. Vanished. The roads are straight enough in any given direction that in that short amount of time that kid would have had to straight up sprint to stand a chance of being out of sight. F demon child is gone. I went home, parked quick and didn't take my time getting inside and locking the door. To this day, never saw the kid again or anything that's given me a bad vibe like that. Damned if I know what was going on. If it was a prank, hats off. You did it, kid. I was a live-in caretaker for a 94-year-old woman with Alzheimer's for about a year and a half. She had moved into her daughter's home deep in the woods of middle of nowhere, Washington. Marie was prone to say weird things like that her sister deceased, mother deceased, and husband deceased were in the house or outside regularly. I had been working with dementia patients for a few years by this point, so it never bothered me. Marie was terrified of the woods. She would tell me about how there's dangerous animals out there, and I could get lost easily so I must always stay inside. She was also worried about her mother and husband having to travel through them. Again, this wasn't worrisome behavior given her health condition. I had been working with her for about six or seven months when I would start waking up to her walking down the halls in the middle of the night. Sundowning is fairly normal for people with Alzheimer's, so again I wasn't troubled by this, but she started going to a specific window and giggling, like she was interacting with someone outside the window. When asked what she was doing, she'd say my mother is out there. Kind of weird, but there's a different perception in her world now. One night in dead of winter, her daughter and I are awoken to the blaring of the house's alarm system. 
The daughter and I checked the doors and windows, none of which seemed to be disturbed or unlocked. The only thing missing is Marie. She is nowhere in the house. Panicked, I rush outside to find her while the daughter continues to search the house. No tracks anywhere, no disturbed snow, nothing. After 10-15 minutes of yelling searching the woods, I start making my way back to house where her daughter was already in the process of calling 911. As I approach the house, I see Marie. Standing outside the window, she normally stood at giggling. There's not a single footstep in the snow around her, nor is she cold to the touch. She's just standing there laughing at nothing, didn't even know she was outside. Her late night window visits became more frequent after this, but less happy. She'd get combative with the window and scream at whoever she believed to be there. Then it just stopped one day. One of the last conversations I had with Marie before she passed, she told me to not let them take me into those woods. I hope they didn't. Unfortunately, it's hard to explain. I was hiking down a trail with my dog in remote northern Wisconsin when I just got a weird feeling. At the exact same time, the heckles on my dog went straight up and he began acting really anxious. About the same time, I came into a clearing in the woods and got hit with what I can only describe as a sound wave. It was like someone was blasting a subwoofer right next to me, but there was nothing around. The nearest road was maybe a mile away. Something told me to get the fout of there, so I quickly turned around and hiked as quickly as possible the rest of the way back. I didn't hear that bass sound after I left the clearing, but I still felt like something was following me. I was jarred back to memories of when I was growing up in New York. I must have been 12 to 14 years of age, having several reoccurring instances that I took for vivid dreams. The dreams include several periods of paralysis that would always end with my choking for air and on most occasions vomiting. In these states, I would be asleep in my bed facing up. I would open my eyes and find that I was drawn to one particular section of my ceiling and I couldn't take my eyes off the area. I would feel the room expand. I may have a better word for this later, but expansion was definitely one of the senses I was having. I would then begin to rise straight up parallel to the ceiling and go through what would be an ever-expanding blackness. I can remember seeing myself even though I was still face up. It was like having a vision of myself instead of actual sight. I would then proceed to feel cold, very cold, and eventually there would be stars. After seeing the stars, everything would eventually go black and the next vision I would have would be of myself on top of a large orb. It was as if I was one with it or molded with it, because it seemed that my body was flush with its surface. I want to say it was silver, but it may be that my mind just saw it as a huge BB. I am in a massive chamber that went on and on forever, no light, no things to gauge distance. At this point, the same things would always happen. I would start to move away from myself. My vision of this always had me seeing myself from over my left shoulder. As I moved further away from the place of the B and BS dock, I would begin to fade, disappear, and the choking would begin. At first, it was just hard to breathe. Then I would be very aware of what was happening to my body that was left behind in my bed, and that is when the puking would begin. The more faded I became, the worse the choking would get, and eventually, I would wind up back in my room with a rushing of great speed. These events happened to me infrequently at first, but then began to escalate. My feelings were that whatever was doing this no longer cared about whether or not I believed it to be a dream or not. It didn't help that I didn't have a family member that would listen to me as they never experienced anything. When this happened, the home always seemed empty or totally devoid of life other than my own. This thing happened to me for what seemed like years. During those years, I went through a lot of behavioral issues, violence, bedwetting, dissociation of family. I was then confronted with the faceless women. The same events would happen, but instead of going off to the void all the time, I would be brought to a huge chamber. 
again very black, no light, at least none that could be explained or truly seen. In this chamber I would be in a circle of about 15-20 apparently mature women. They were spread out about arm's length apart, and I would float in the middle of the circle and be asked to choose my mother. I would look around at all of them, and they were all very similar. As I would try to see them better, I would either move closer to the one I thought was my mother, or just concentrate on the face. When I looked at their faces, they were always missing, gone or blurred like an old black and white TV screen. It was impossible to choose, and when I did, I would always begin gasping and choking, and would be told to pick again. This would go on and on without ever having an answer or an end. I'm not quite sure at what stage of my life this finally ended, but as I get older it gets easier for me to remember these details. My story takes place in the fall of 1978. I was 12 years old and myself and three other kids were walking along a trail along a bean field near our old childhood woods. The woods surround this bean field and we were... We had our heads down looking on the trail looking for used shotgun shells and such. We used to collect them as kids so we weren't paying attention to what our surroundings were. All of a sudden, one of the kids went running by me screaming and yelling, taking off in the opposite direction. I had my back turned to whatever he was running from. I turned around and the other two kids went running by me yelling, run, run, run and I looked up and about 25 to 30 feet away from me was this headless figure standing there. I froze. I was like, for like five seconds, I was staring at this thing, and I got a good look at it, and the first thing I noticed was that it was wearing one of those shoulder bullet belts, like from the movie The Good, The Bad and the Ugly Nori says, you mean, like the banditos used to wear. Yeah, yeah, right and I didn't see a weapon or anything, and obviously, it had no head. And it looked like it was wearing some type of uniform. It was an old Civil War type uniform. It had black boots up to its knees. I stood there for a second before I took off. I was just in shock, and this figure slowly raised its arm, and it pointed its finger at me. And I got a good look at its hand, and it was pale white like it was dipped in flour, I can remember it like it was yesterday, and I took off running finally and ran into the woods where this other kid was hiding, and we watched as this figure walked alongside the bean field where we were standing, and it went off across the trail into the other side of the woods, and it disappeared. This happened to my mom back in the late 70s. First of all, we live in an area in the south that is known for beautiful lakes, rivers, ponds, and woods. Due to the beautiful bodies of water and wooded areas, we have state parks, city parks, etc., and many of them near the water. There is a state park in our area, which was established in the 60s. This park is located on a river, and it is down a long dirt road through the woods. There are no houses nearby. The park is a huge grassy area facing the river, with rustic looking picnic tables, big oak trees and a rustic building with bathrooms. When my mom was young, the state park service had some type program where teenagers could work for the summer. She was happy to get in the program and make some money jobs were not plentiful in our area. Her job for the summer was to be the lifeguard at this particular state park. She loved the river so she was happy. On weekends, the park was full. On weekdays, many times, no one came down there, and when anyone did show up, it might be like one family, possibly two. So, this was a weekday. It was morning, and no one was at the park except my mom. The lifeguard chair was not like most. It was handmade rough wood to keep up with the rustic design of the park, and it was not up very high. This is relevant since no one had shown up at the park. My mom settled in her rustic, uncomfortable lifeguard chair with a good book. Some guy seemed to show up out of nowhere. She looked up from her book, and he was just kind of there. He was wearing dirty jeans and no shirt and looked generally unkempt, but in our area, that look was not necessarily unusual. She asked could she help him, 
and he asked her if he could skinny dip in the river. She thought he was just joking around and of course, she told him no. She was feeling a little creeped out because no one was there except her and him. But the rangers usually rode down every couple of hours and circled through the park, so she knew they were subject to show up at any time. Anyway, after telling this guy he could not skinny dip, he stripped down to his boxer shorts and dove into the water. My mom was more than a little freaked out at this point. She was, and is a tiny person, at the time 5 foot 2 and 115 pounds. Well, while she is looking around nervously hoping a ranger, or anyone will come driving up, the guy gets out of the water. Of course, being wet and wearing only boxers, my mom could see everything he had. He walks up to the lifeguard chair and asks my mom if she wants to go out in the woods and have sex with him. She is really scared now and she said no and asked him to leave. I don't remember exactly how he said it, but he reaches up remember, the chair is not very high and puts his hand on her leg and basically lets her know he would and could force her. She looked around and as luck would have it, she saw one of the rangers driving up. She jumped out of the lifeguard chair and ran toward the road and toward the ranger. The guy disappeared. The rangers looked for him and never could find him. For the rest of the summer, the rangers patrolled a lot more and my mother never saw the creepy guy again. She said it was one of the scariest moments she ever had. I now live in southeastern Pennsylvania, which was the hot spot of a UFO flap in 2008. Just a few miles away from my current residence, we had one of the greatest UFO encounters. However, I will leave that for another day. In the early 60s, the small suburb of San Juan outside the city of Manila was visited by several UFO sightings, and later what is now referred to as Mothman. I was born and raised in that little suburban town about three miles from where these series of sightings took place. When I was about a year and a half old, my parents moved to a townhouse apartment in the small hamlet of Little Baguio near San Juan. It's a picturesque Spanish-type suburb with stucco houses with red tile roofs inhabited by the well-to-do, with tended gardens. In between these homes ranch-style and townhouse-type apartments were randomly scattered. It was in one of these apartments where the haunting of my father started. As my mother and uncle faithfully recounted, my father would retire to his study as a writer of books and poems to sit at his typewriter in the fading twilight after dinner. Outside his den, a creek could be seen running the length of the house through a huge, jalousied window. One evening, according to their recollection, a distinct hum could be heard. As my father paused from his typing, he glanced out the fading light of the twilight to behold a nine-foot being standing with a black cape in the shadow of a large tree perched at the edge of the creek. The creature was jet black, with the cape glinting in the starlight like leather. As my father backed away from his desk to observe the creature, he noticed a face take form with red eyes and a mask of menace. The creature had horns like a goat and long face that exuded deep horror. My uncles who were close to my father recalls the night my father had ran from the room in fear he had believed he was hallucinating the events, only to find the creature hanging one night like a bat from the breadth of the expansive den window. It was looking down at him in menace. As they ran to the room, they were overcome by a sense of foreboding and sadness. Upon arrival, the creature had already disappeared, to be replaced by a full moon and the sound of water in the creek. One night, several months later, my father refused to sleep, fearful the creature would enter his dreams. My mother set up vigil with a live-in servant, a young woman who believed the creature was a demon. As my father finally slept with my mother sipping tea in the next room, a yell ensued from the maid who had entered my father's den to check on a scratching noise. As my mother rushed into the room, she finally sighted the creature. It hung, bat wings spread, the breadth of the window which was about 10-12 feet in length, glaring pointedly at my mother as she approached. Fearful but determined to confront the creature which haunted her husband, she reached for a cross on the opposite wall and charged the window with it, 
praying the Our Father as she approached. In the darkness, the creature folded into itself, cloak and all into the ground under the window and disappeared. The local priest was consulted and blessings were attempted on the apartment and on my father. However, oppressed by the continuous haunting, my father finally committed S as a means of escape. That same night, my mother tucked my belongings with me and fled, never returning to the apartment. The creature followed us to my grandmother's house where a priest held mass and blessed the house and all of us. At some point, the sightings of the creature finally stopped. It was only my mother and the maid who saw it. But other ghosts continued to haunt the town, a scene of much bloodshed in World War II when the Japanese invaded the town. That was my first encounter with the unknown. A husband and wife, taking a scenic drive through the Ligonier Valley, saw something very strange and unexpected on the afternoon of November 23, 2015. At about 2 p.m., they were traveling on a rural road about two miles from Ligonier. The driver of the car noticed some movement in some bushes on the right side of the road. Suddenly an animal exited the bushes and began to trot from right to left in front of the vehicle. The driver stopped about 10-20 feet from the animal to obtain a better look. The couple was startled by what they were seeing. This was no ordinary animal, as they could see the outline of the shape of the animal, but it was not solid and there was no color or fur observed. The husband as soon as he saw the creature thought that it was somewhat like a fox, but could not be sure since no physical features could be seen. His wife also agreed that it was a four-legged creature similar to a fox. The body of the animal was estimated to be about 18 inches to 24 inches long and had a tail that was about one quarter or half the length of the body. The animal was a lot smaller than a deer. The husband told me that the creature had a smoky veil shape. His wife, however, got a better and longer look at the animal as it entered the road and trotted in front of the car. She told me that she could see through it, and that there was a specific area within the body shape that was like an energy pattern. It was like a smoky heat wave. They watched as the animal continued to cross the road and entered some brush on the left side of the road and was not seen again. The couple didn't hear any sound or notice any smell during the four or five second observation. Location is a campground that may or may not be currently accessible. I know it was closed gated off from the road for quite a while a good few years ago. Factory Shoals Campground, a good 20 minutes outside of Covington, Georgia. Yes, that's where they filmed the Vampire Diaries. Anyway, Factory Shoals Recreation Area, the campground. I'll say that I've never seen many other people out at this huge park, even on the nicest days but a friend lives in a subdivision down the road. The area is sporadically rural if that makes sense. You'll come across a school, a gas station, and a pretty big neighborhood, but nothing else for another six or seven minutes down the road. The campground is next to the Alcavi River. In order to reach it, you have to drive through Newton Factory Cemetery, an old cemetery with mostly older graves sitting on the side of the road, slightly hidden by trees, smack in nowhere. I've often wondered about this. Graves date back to the 1800s, maybe illegible ones or even older, and at some point somebody says, hey, let's put a road through the cemetery and create a campground. So you go down this janky road through the cemetery about a quarter mile, and here you are, barely managed campground. There's maybe seven sites, mostly next to the river. I'm with a friend. It's a nice evening, the light bustling of the river is calming. There's only one other site occupied a bit down, no street lamps. The only light you have is the fire and your flashlight. So when we're headed to bed, fire extinguished, it's pitch black. You can see the stars, there must not have been a moon that night. I'm laying down and close my eyes and realize it's too damn quiet. Deafening silence. I jump back up and go to my friend's tent and tell her I'm suddenly feeling creeped. 
We both realize the bugs and even the river have gone silent. To be fair, the river is only about eight feet across and about two feet deep here we had commented on the peaceful lull of the river all through the evening. With curiosity stronger than fear, we walk over toward the water and observe a mist or fog lifting from the water. We are a little anxious and don't want to get right up on the bank to see if we can see the water moving, so my friend remember a light-up fishing lure type thing she has in her bag, fetches it, tosses it in, and it just sits there, it doesn't flow down. So it's like the river came to a complete stop and its movement is releasing a thick mist, and it's completely dark and silent, except for that lure and its faint red glow barely visible through the thick mist. We both kind of start muttering that we should maybe pack up quick and leave before I see the spark and hear a gun firing not 15 feet away from us. Shine a light for a split second before we're both in the car, it's cranked, and we're tearing out of there. I didn't see anyone either from shining my light or from the headlights, and I about had a panic attack coming through the cemetery after that with the elongated shadows from headstones and monuments. I didn't sleep that night even after crashing on my friend's couch. Logic tells me the quiet could have come from a prowling human with a gun, but the mist and a river current stopping, and what if the... how Heitfer followed us. I didn't even gather my tent and sleeping bag before going home the next day. I luckily had placed my bag in my car for some reason instead of taking it inside, so my only loss was the small old tent, the sleeping bag, a battery-powered lantern, and a camp chair. So it's maybe a year later, and I'm in the area with my husband, and he doesn't believe me about a campground on the other side of a cemetery. It's midday and I decide to show him, pull up, see that the road is now blocked off beyond the graves with a sign that states the campground is currently closed. We get out a minute to walk around the cemetery. It's a dirt road, there's a lot of kicked up dust settling. So much so that my husband asks if there's water in my trunk, he's coughing. I go to get it, cursing under my breath at the thick layer of settled dust already on my precious sports car and notice. A very clean and distinct fresh tiny handprint on my trunk. It had to be fresh because I stood there and watched the still settling dirt start to stick and fill it in. We'd never made it more than a few feet from the car, there's nobody else out there. Again, we book it out of there. I know there's a legend about parking cars on hills in certain areas at night, and you'll find little handprints on the back and your car will have moved. My car didn't move, but those were legit fresh little handprints. I'm not sure if the cemetery brings playful souls, the entire area holds on to some type of energy, or there's just some incredibly sneaky people that hang out in minimally trafficked woods and backroads. I'll reiterate that this is part of a park, a recreational area that has grills and picnic tables about three minutes down the road, and I never saw anyone there the few times I visited aside from my friend, husband, or the other tent. I saw further down the river when we tried to camp. I've never gone back. I've been to other places in Newton Co. though that give off similar vibes. The Alcavi Trestle, Gaither Plantation, a random church smack dab in the middle of the woods. That creepy old gas station, that's the story. I used to live in Japan, a place that is an enchanting blend of the ancient and the modern. A friend and I decided to take a trip to the mountains, a respite from the bustling city life. This friend of mine was a fellow adventurer, someone who shared my love for nature and the mysteries it held. One evening, during our mountain stay, we decided to go for a night walk, a ramble through the unfamiliar terrain under the starlit sky. The mountains were a maze of paths and trails, each leading to something new and unexplored. As we ambled along, we stumbled upon a Torii gate, standing alone, its vermilion columns stark against the dark mountainside. But it was a Torii gate unlike any other we had seen. Instead of leading to a shrine or temple, as they usually do, this one was met with an impassable rock face. It was an enigma a puzzle that the mountains had thrown our way. Torii gates are symbolic passageways in Shintoism, 
marking the transition from the profane to the sacred. But what sacredness could a rock face hold? In our shared confusion, we both looked up at the sky, as if seeking answers from the cosmos. And that's when we saw it. A great multicolored light, hovering just above us, close enough to touch yet ethereal in its beauty. It was like a celestial gas, shimmering in the full spectrum of colors, casting an otherworldly glow on the Torii and the rock face. Then, as suddenly as it had appeared, it disappeared, leaving behind a sky full of stars and two awestruck observers. We stood there, staring at the place where the light had been, a sense of something incredibly significant settling over us. We felt changed, though we couldn't pinpoint exactly how. It was a very odd feeling, like we had touched something beyond our comprehension. Neither of us knew what had happened that night, under the shadow of the Torii and the glow of the mysterious light. Yet it remains one of my most unforgettable experiences, a tale of the mountains that I carry in my heart. The first time I saw the Leviathan, I felt a cold shiver run down my spine. I'm Agent Walker, a combat diver with the U.S. Coast Guard. I've faced plenty of challenges in the deep sea, but this... This was something else. The creature was monstrous, its body twisting and turning beneath the surface of the Atlantic, its dark silhouette blotting out the sunlight. It had risen from the depths and was now a threat to the eastern seaboard. Our mission was simple, in theory neutralize the Leviathan and save the coast. But there was more at stake for me. I was forced to confront my own fears, my own demons. You see, I have a past that not many know about a past shrouded in mystery and filled with creatures of the deep. I've always felt a strange connection with the ocean and its inhabitants, an affinity that was both a blessing and a curse. As our unit prepared for the confrontation, I found myself staring into the Inkai depths, my heart pounding in my chest. I felt a strange kinship with the beast. Just like me, it was a creature of the deep, brought to the surface against its will, feared and misunderstood. The plan was daring. We had to get close enough to the Leviathan to inject it with a powerful sedative, allowing us to steer it back into the deep ocean where it belonged. The task fell to me, the combat diver. I was to swim up to the creature, avoid its wrath, and complete the mission. As I plunged into the cold water, my past flashed before my eyes. The memories, the fears, the secrets, they all came crashing down. But I pushed them aside, focused on the task at hand. I swam towards the Leviathan, my heart hammering in my chest. The creature was even more magnificent up close. Its body was covered in ancient scars, a testament to a long life spent in the ocean's depths. Its eyes were filled with a strange intelligence, a silent plea. I could feel its confusion, its fear. It was not the monster we made it out to be. It was just lost, scared. Summoning all my courage, I swam up to it, the syringe in my hand. I plunged it into the creature, and for a moment our eyes met. There was an understanding there, a silent agreement. It knew what I was trying to do. And then it began to descend, its massive body sinking into the darkness. The mission was a success. The Leviathan was back where it belonged, and the eastern seaboard was safe. But more than that, I had confronted my own past, faced my fears. I was not just a combat diver, but a man with a deep connection to the ocean and its creatures. And that connection, that understanding, had saved us all. Thanks for listening. Hope you already fallen asleep. See you tomorrow at the same time.